we're going to start with just a few pictures of raised beds from around my local community, just to show that one of the advantages of working with raised beds is that they're really flexible on where you can put them, whether it's in a front yard space, because maybe that's where there's the most space and the most sun around an otherwise water-wise garden, something more mixed in with fruit trees, or as was the case in the previous place that my partner and I lived in Altadena, California, where our really only place in the yard where we had good sun as well as space was in a longer than we needed concrete driveway. So we just built quite tall raised beds, uh, close to two feet tall, right on top of the concrete. And that provided enough depth and just enough drainage for us to have a very successful vegetable garden there. Working with raised beds, also people start to think about trellises, vertical growing, really maximizing the use of space. Raised beds are definitely not the only way to go with vegetable gardening, but they are a popular option, especially for like most of the people here who are looking for one or two vegetable beds that will fit otherwise into their backyard. And so this is our outline for today plan for raised vegetable bed gardening success. We're gonna talk about when to and when not to grow in raised beds. We'll cover raised bed construction, the easy and durable way. We're gonna talk about seeds, starts and planting. We're gonna talk about water. Understanding water is critical to a great harvest, especially in Southern California. So talk about watering and irrigation. And then I'll provide some crop guides and other tips. We might not get through all of that because I have a lot in there, but I wanted to include as much as possible so we can maximize the information we cover in the time we have today. And then that PDF will be available for download for you to get the rest of that reference material afterwards. And so before we jump into it, I'll cover a few things. I see some questions coming in in the chat about whether this presentation can be emailed out. For those of you who have joined us since the very beginning, which is quite a few people, you can download all of the slides in this presentation today. I'm going to get that set up online immediately after this workshop at this web address in the lower left, cbwcd.org slash presentations cbwc.org slash presentations. That'll take you to a page where it's just a list of links where you can download the most recent one. It's, it's going to be a large file. It might be close to uh, so somewhere between 70 and 125 megabytes, even kind of compressed because there's a lot of slides. Uh, so just give it some time to download. Uh, the easiest way to do it in most web browsers is to right click and then do like download linked file as or save linked file as. Some web browsers will want to kind of load that whole PDF into like a new window. If it starts doing that, just give it a few minutes because it is pretty large. And then once it finally loads, you can save it out from there. This is also being recorded and it will, after some light editing of some of the stuff at the beginning, be posted to our YouTube online workshop playlist next week. So if you want to rewatch or share it with anyone else, that'll be at cbwcd.org slash YouTube. And then a quick note about how to best interact with me and ask questions today. Because it's a large group, I don't call on individual people to like turn their audio on and ask questions. We find that there's a lot of downtime with that. And so the best way to ask questions is to type it into the Q&A function in your Zoom interface. And so you'll see there's a little button that says Q&A and it has a couple of little uh, chat bubbles. And so if you click on that, it'll launch something just like the chat that's specifically for Q&A, which makes it very easy for me to keep an eye on the questions coming in and then I can manage them as I answer them. What I'm going to do basically is keep the workshop flowing and then as I transition between different topics or subtopics, depending on if there's questions that have come in, I will stop, I'll get through the questions and then we'll move on. So feel free to type them in whenever you want, but then I'll kind of wait to answer them in groups. Because we have a large group, as we are going to be going through, the questions that I will answer as we're going are going to really be related to the questions that come in related to the exact content that we're talking about. 
if you have questions and more about like your specific situation, I'm happy to stay uh, even like after the end of the workshop, uh, later than noon to make sure that I answer all of those. But I just can't stop and necessarily answer those as we're going through the other content because we need to make sure that we cover everything. So feel free to ask me those questions, but probably holding them towards the end and then typing them in during our last Q&A period at the very end would be the best way to go. Uh, so that's kind of questions. If you have other just kind of general comments or anything like that, feel free to type them into the chat like some people have already been doing. Uh, I do always read all of the chat at the end as well as try to keep it on that as I go as well. A uh, quick question came in as to whether we're going to talk about types of wood to use. Uh, yes, we will definitely be covering that. And somewhere in here, we'll take about a five minute break or so towards the middle, let people get a drink, use the restroom, whatever else they might need to do for a couple of minutes as we go. And so getting started, I might wanna cover reasons to grow your own vegetables even before we get into raised beds or not. Because this will help us think about how to make the best use of our precious raised vegetable bed space. Because most of us backyard gardeners are not going to grow all of the vegetables we consume. That's just not practical. Uh, my partner and I have a large ambitious vegetable garden. We still don't grow all of the vegetables we consume, we grow a bunch of them. And so we're still thinking about choosing our crops and why we're growing each thing. Reasons to grow your own vegetables include to have the best possible flavor and the freshest product, the flavor of especially certain things like uh, greens, salad greens for me is always a big one, uh, is just uncomparable when you harvest it right away, bring it into the house and eat it right away. You can grow varieties that are not available to buy locally or that you can't get in good top quality. So for me, a priority is uh, garlic in our larger vegetable bed because you kind of need a, a large area to, uh, to do it. If I just had one or two beds, I wouldn't do it. But the garlic varieties you can grow have such different flavor profiles than just what's available even at the farmer's market. Or carrots as well. Sometimes it's really hard to find carrots that taste as good as homegrown ones that really have a, a kind of earthiness and a complexity to the flavor. If you are intending to do this and make careful decisions with how much stuff you buy for your garden, you can potentially save money. If you are very careful, you can do that. For most people though, especially if you just have one or two raised beds, that's not a huge motivating factor by the time you take into account all of the costs of setting up your system, buying seeds or buying starts. You're generally not gonna save a ton of money unless you kind of get to an economy of scale with a large garden. Uh, but there are so many other reasons to, to grow, including stuff that maybe you can't get anywhere else and that freshness. If you are one of those people who currently have a lawn in that area and you're thinking about trading it up for a vegetable garden, you can actually save water. So vegetable crops themselves are generally high water using plants, similar to the water requirements of a healthy, well-growing, luxuriously watered lawn. However, most of our vegetable growing areas end up being about 50% pathway in, the in between the beds and about 50% bed. So especially if you are working with drip irrigation, which I encourage you to do for vegetable growing or watering with the hose and make sure you're watering the right amount, then you could potentially still grow these high water crops, but save about half the water it would take to have a well watered lawn. However, that's if you water appropriately. Oftentimes people really overwater their vegetable gardens. And so if that's one of your motivations, definitely pay attention to the irrigation portion of this workshop. And there I'll really guide you in terms of how to make sure you're doing that correctly. And also to enjoy the process. Gardening, vegetable gardening is good light exercise. Uh, I think it's a lot of people find it good for your mental health, provides you a little bit of that connection with your food. You get to slow down and see things grow. And so it can be an enjoyable process. As long as you make decisions to set yourself up for success and make sure that your garden is going to be the right size. It can become stressful if you're trying to do too much more than you really want to do. So thinking about what's gonna be right for you is critical as well. And also 
last but not least, to impress your cat. So this is a cauliflower that was dinner last night for my partner and I harvested fresh from our garden yesterday. But there's also some reasons not to grow your own vegetables. It can be time consuming and a lot of work if you build and plant too much garden, though just one or two raised beds is manageable for many people. So this is a picture of when I redid my parents' backyard for them and not a huge backyard and they weren't super ambitious, but just one raised bed so that they can grow some vegetables, be involved with that process. And then seasonally, sometimes they do get a lot of salad greens or grow a couple of cherry tomatoes in the summer, but it, it's enough to enjoy it. It doesn't necessarily save money versus buying produce. Uh, again, that goes back to being careful if you're trying to save money about, about your expenditures. If you're not growing what you want to eat. So that's a huge one. I mean, and that's one that, that I am still learning. So sometimes people get excited about growing all these exotic crops, but it's not really what they want to cook with. Uh, it can grow, go both ways. In my first number of years of vegetable gardening, I learned to do a lot of cooking and learned to enjoy a lot of new crops that I had never really eaten because I knew that I was going to grow them and to figure out what to do with them. But still also in a larger, larger vegetable garden, that comes down to scale as well. Uh, so for example, I'm still trying to convince myself radishes are so easy to grow that we always end up growing too many radishes. And then we can give them away to friends and neighbors as well. We donated a lot of rad radishes to a local food bank uh, this winter, but really thinking about what it is that you or your family want to eat and making sure that you're, you're growing those. And then for most of you, I really recommend starting small, just a couple of beds, or maybe just one, get the hang of it, understand how much effort thought it takes to maintain a small vegetable garden, and then expand from there after that if you want. I've definitely seen a few people think, oh, this is totally you know, what I'm going to be doing, going from never having grown a vegetable to I'm gonna be trying to grow all my own food, and that just can become overwhelming. So start small, be successful, build on your successes. And so just a couple of questions that have come in, and then we'll talk about raised beds versus some other growing methods. Uh, so Robert asked, will this be recorded and available for download? And so you probably just joined us. And so I will put that into the chat. So it's there for everyone. Will be available sometime midweek next week after some light editing on our YouTube channel. It just went to the chat, cbwcd.org slash YouTube. Uh, Amy had a question about uh, the raised beds that I showed where I had burnt the wood uh, as an experiment to see if it would uh, kind of help long-term. Uh, if you have more questions about that, Amy, I can answer it at the very end. Basically, that was just the experiment that I did at that one project and specifically for raised beds, I probably will not do that in the future. Uh, for other things, I like doing that, but probably not for raised beds in the future. And uh, so yeah, the, with that, let's go. So raised beds versus in the ground beds versus containers, because that is not the only way to grow. A lot of people when they think vegetable gardening go straight to raised beds. Everything has its pros and cons. If you have good soil where you live, especially so in Southern California, like most of our valley areas uh, from like Ontario, a lot of the Inland Empire Valley, Pomona Valley, where I am, San Gabriel Valley, San Fernando Valley, those good deep alluvial plain soils, sandy, sandy loam soil. Uh, oftentimes our soil in the ground in our backyards, even if it's kind of dried out, has been neglected, honestly, at the end of the day is better, especially with just a little bit of compost and some hydration than the best soil that we can buy locally from a soil yard, because what those soil yards are doing essentially is taking bulk soils that are often like come from construction sites and then trying to amend them and make them better. And so for example, in my backyard in Pomona, we have a few raised beds. Most of our vegetable gardening is in the ground and we have had to work much harder to build good soil in the raised beds where we paid for the soil and had it delivered 
than the, the beds in the ground. And so there are times for raised beds. There's reasons to have them, but it's not the only way to go. If you have decent soil already, it is much, much, much more economical to establish and maintain a garden in the ground where you don't have to pay for wood, the wood doesn't rot out over time, you're not needing to pay for soil to be brought in. And so if you're trying to uh, grow food to save money, if that's one of your goals, then really thinking hard about whether or not growing in the ground will work for you is, uh, is definitely worth thinking about it. It would not be economical in my yard for us to do all of our growing and raised beds for the amount of gardening that we're doing. So we're very specific about where we used raised beds. But if you just have one or two beds, uh, then and it works with your budget, then sure, you can you can go for it. Raised beds are great in areas with heavy clay soil, where the soil is like mostly rock with little bits of soil in between, or if you have lots of gophers, we're not going to talk too much about that. But you can build your raised beds. And before you fill them with soil, you can have hardware cloth, which is like that thicker wire chicken wire that's more of a square pattern a three quarter inch or half inch uh, hardware cloth in the bottom of the raised bed to keep the gophers out. And that makes a world of difference. Even if they get some of the smaller roots that go through, most of the roots are still gonna be protected. So heavy clay soil, mostly rock soil or lots of gophers, great reasons to, to go with raised beds. Raised beds are great for efficient harvest of like small vegetables. So small fancy salad greens, like baby greens, uh, are great for raised beds. If you have, even if you have decent soil, if there's like a lot of rock in the soil, uh, then carrots can be easy to grow in raised beds as well. And so that's how we use raised beds in, in my yard is really for, we grow a lot of small salad greens, especially in the cool season. It's just a lot easier to harvest them out of the raised beds than it is to get down on the ground and be reaching. Whereas most of our like tomatoes, the larger crops or things like that go in the ground. Raised beds are great for people with back problems or other mobility restrictions. So that's why we built those double high, like uh, almost two feet raised beds for the one raised bed I built for my parents is because my mom has some back issues. And so the difference between gardening and raised beds versus having to get on the ground is huge for her in terms of actually enjoying the process of gardening at all. And containers are a possibility. The main reason why I would encourage people to grow in containers is, is if that's your only option, because especially where it's hot in Southern California, containers take a lot more work with watering and really need careful consideration and goal setting to, uh, to be successful with growing vegetables in containers. Some veggies will work, some just really need a, a bigger soil mass to, to be uh, useful. Uh, garden layout. There's no one particular way to do garden layout, but here's some things I've noted over time, learning both from my mistakes and other things that I've seen people do. In most cases, like a standard raised bed is eight feet long and about four feet wide. That's not a hard and fast rule. You can have it be any shape that's going to work for you. But the reason why that's kind of become a standard is because it's a very practical shape. You want a certain width and a certain depth to have flexibility to grow a variety of crops over time and enough soil mass. So sometimes I'll see people have like an only two foot wide raised bed and you can do that, but it's not as flexible in terms of what you can grow in it. And it also because it's a lot of wood containing not a lot of volume of soil becomes proportionately very expensive to construct. So you, you, you want your beds to fit your site, but about eight foot by four foot is kind of standard. It's nice because you can buy a few uh, 12 foot pieces of lumber and have them cut and make that or eight foot and then another eight foot and have them cut in half. Uh, so it's, it's pretty flexible and meets the, the lumber sizes that are sold pretty well. And it just gives you a, a good, good amount of space without being excessive to grow in. Four foot wide is for an average adult with a raised bed, about as wide as they can kind of easily reach into the middle to do any weeding or harvesting or things like that. 
So if uh, for whatever reason, your reach is less than that, or you have a back issue and that's not comfortable, then you can make them a, a little bit narrower as well. But for lack of any other specific reason, I consider that kind of a standard. It's important to allow a generous path space in between your raised beds. When I first started gardening, I was thinking, I need to maximize my growing space. I wanna grow a ton of vegetables. I left 18 inches or maybe two feet in between each of my beds. And I slowly learned that for most people, the total amount of space is not really their restriction. It's often more sun or time, or even if they only have a small space, the difference between making the path tiny and making it a little bit more generous is not actually going to determine how many beds they can fit. And what I've found is that if you are growing using good techniques, kind of doing the things that we're gonna be talking about throughout this class, then your vegetables will be happy and mid season and into the harvest season, a lot of crops will grow abundantly over the edges of the bed. And if you only have 18 inches or two feet, it's easy for that pathway in between the beds to completely disappear and have to be kind of bushwhacking or breaking branches on your vegetables as you try to go through to harvest or do your maintenance. And so I normally go with three feet in between my beds these days, which means that things can grow over the bed edges from either side. And this is an in, in the ground bed or a raised bed. And you still have enough room to kind of get through and do your thing. So just because the bed ends doesn't mean the space that the vegetables take up ends. So it's not necessarily wasted space, but you need some space to allow the vegetables to do their thing, especially if you don't wanna to have to be trimming and cutting back and, and breaking branches as you go through the garden. And then finally, uh, in your pathway areas, I'd encourage you to mulch. It's usually with the wood chip mulch. And then if the area has weeds, you can use just broken down corrugated cardboard boxes uh, underneath that wood chip mulch in your pathways, which can help quite a bit. In terms of a recommendation for bed depth, what I would say is that for the vast majority of people, uh, about a foot on top of whatever subsoil you have is going to be just fine, especially if you loosen up your subsoil underneath. If you have a specific reason and budget to raise those beds higher up, then you can do so. So for example, here, the reason why we went with these double high beds is because they're on top of concrete. And we knew that the bottom layer after irrigation was gonna get a little bit mucky, not totally an ideal growing situation. And so the thought was by putting them up that high, at least the top foot will always stay pretty nice. The bottom layer can drain out slowly if it needs to, that worked very well. If you have back issues, that double height raised bed, almost two feet. So these are two layers of two by 12 can be very useful as well. Uh, in my yard, we have two beds that are this double height, which are the beds where we grow all of our little cut and come again, baby salad greens, because it makes that harvest really efficiently. Two beds that are uh, about 12 inches tall and then everything else in the ground. So just kind of a general, general uh, idea. Uh, if you have really rocky ground, most of the primary roots of most of your vegetables will fit in like a one inch high bed. And so it'll just be like the smaller roots going down underneath. So in most cases, I would start with trying to grow in uh, about one foot tall beds. You can always add on to them later if you need to, but remember that a double height bed like this is literally twice as expensive and almost twice as much effort to build as is a bed half that high. So also goes into kind of budget materials, all that sort of stuff, uh, because the cost of setting up a raised bed system can add up pretty quickly. And with that, I think that's a good transition to us starting to talk about recommended ways of building a raised bed vegetable system. I have recently become a convert to a new way of building raised beds, which as far as I know, just wasn't available when I first started uh, vegetable gardening. These days at 
many big box hardware stores around here. That includes Lowe's and Home Depot. You can get these things, which are called planter wall block. Essentially, they're, they're kind of made of the same concrete material as cinder blocks, but they are obviously look very different and are for a different purpose. These are for using along with two by six lumber. So they're five and a half inches tall, just like two by six and have a proper spaced kind of channel that that two by six lumber can slide into for the corners because corners are always the weak spot and the tough spot about constructing raised beds. In terms of building wooden raised beds over the years, I've intentionally, every time I build them, I, I build them a little bit different and I've been trying to find the right balance between cost of setting them up, simplicity and durability. Uh, and so I've tried lots of different hardware anchoring options in the corners, different things. And this I'm convinced is by far the best way. I found out about these things right after I built the raised beds where I live now. And I wish that I had known about them sooner. So this is kind of what I teach. So basically one of these goes in, e in each corner and one of these only gets about five and a half inches tall, but you can build them multiple. So I'll show some, some of that process and they're not super expensive. They're about $2 and 50 cents each. So if you end up adding up all of the hardware, if you're getting like nice sized bolts, uh, the wood that would go in the corners of a standard raised bed, and we'll look at some pictures. It, it is cost competitive. It also allows you to, to uh, use cheaper two by six lumber, which is a little bit cheaper than the standard two by 12 lumber that people normally use with raised beds. So this is often what happens with raised beds, no matter what kind of screws or bolts you use. Standard raised bed, as I've long built them and was showed and seen the most examples, you use basically a, a piece of four by four in each corner of the raised bed, and you do something to anchor your wood into that. So this is an example where I was trying to do it at minimal cost to see how it would work. So we used uh, standard but high quality uh, wood screws and what you can see is over time as kind of moisture and outside conditions have made the wood warp some, it can pull the screw out. At the same time, uh, for example, like when I built a previous set of raised beds at my parents' house, so I've got to kind of study how long those lasted, I used kind of expensive carriage bolts to have a really secure connection, but about five or six years after the initial construction, Although the wood on the outside would otherwise be hanging in there and doing all right, this post on the inside has rotted enough that those bolts just can't hold in anymore. The, the threads uh, just fall right out and it'll be a lot of work, probably more than it's worth to dig the, just the posts out and try to reset them and rescrew it with all the soil there. So we're probably gonna have to rebuild the whole thing. So this is kind of always where the problem normally starts with maintenance, no matter what kind of wood you use, even if it's like redwood or something more expensive that's supposed to uh, resist rot more. And so with this system, because there's no bolt and because the wood is in this channel, if it warps a little bit, not an issue, if one piece rots over time, you can slide it out and put in a new piece. And so here's just going to be a quick run through of putting it together. And so if you are going for a true four foot bed width, also remember though, that because the true corner of this system is gonna kind of be like where this hole is, that you're going to want to cut the wood or if you're getting it at a hardware store or a lumber yard and don't have a setup yourself to cut it, they will cut it for you. You just have to ask. Normally they'll cut it for free. You just need a few cuts. So bring a list of the lengths you need. So remember to cut the wood a little shorter to account for the extra length of the block. Uh, it, it ends up being about three and a half inches less than if it was just like a standard wood raised bed when you add up kind of both sizes. Uh, that's not a super exact measurement, so you can measure exactly yours. Uh, I'm not sure if they come in, in different brands, so worth kind of just measuring it and remember it's gonna be 
uh, this length twice because it's both sides, but this will basically get you there a little bit shorter on each length. So from the four foot lengths, you'd take out about three and a half inches as well as the eight foot lengths. And this builds a about a five and a half inch tall section. So basically for each height, each level that you're building up, you'll need four of these planter blocks. You'll need two feet of approximately, I mean, two of approximately three foot, eight and a half inches, two by sixes for the widths and about, or and two approximately seven foot, eight and a half inches long pieces for the length. I recommend just going with whatever is cheap for the lumber and locally available. So here in Southern California, that's Douglas fir. If you're in other parts of the country, that might be pine. Redwood doesn't seem to last that much longer in my experience. And so that's kind of the, the quote quality outdoor rot resistant wood that would be sold in Southern California. And if you go to some lumber yards and tell them that you're building a raised bed, they, they might say, oh, you need to, you need to buy redwood, which can be about like three times more expensive uh, to, to build something like this, two to three times more expensive. I, I don't believe there's any practical difference. I did a project where we built two raised beds the exact same construction techniques, two made out of the cheaper Douglas fir, two made out of redwood, gardened in them for about five years. The soil got dug out on the inside. So all of those raised beds were still functional after five years. On the inside, all of them had started to rot and the rot looked to be about the same amount, which just starts to happen with the moisture. It slowly rots from the inside out over time. Another reason why, if you're thinking about a long-term garden, uh, you know, there is a lifetime to the wood and raised beds where if you're growing in the ground, you don't really need to worry about that. But again, there's reasons for growing in raised beds. And so in that experiment that I did after those five years, unless you knew these two are fir, these two are redwood, nobody would be able to tell the difference, both in terms of what the wood looked like after that amount of time being out in the elements or as well what what uh any difference at all sorry i was keeping an eye on the question answering kind of lost lost my track because there's a lot of chat coming in and we will we will uh get to that in a moment so that's my recommendation go with what's cheaper i i have not found it being worth it to get more expensive lumber i do not trust using treated wood or pallet wood to build raised beds. The reason why is because there are heavy metals in those woods. Those heavy metals can accumulate in our vegetables if and basically when they get into the soil. So it's a personal decision. I know some people who aren't worried about that, but for me, if I'm growing my own vegetables, one of my motivations is to have the healthiest kind of cleanest vegetables uh, available. And heavy metals will accumulate, especially in root crops and in leaf crops. Uh, fruit like tomatoes and stuff like that. It, it, it's not biologically uh, as much of an issue, but definitely in the roots and in the greens. So I do not recommend those. I don't recommend treating them. Like I know people who have used boiled linseed oil, uh, actually modern boiled linseed oil contains heavy metals in it. So I just keep it clean and natural. Uh, some people are interested in building like corrugated metal raised beds. I don't recommend that for hot areas like Southern California because of the amount of heat roots up against the edge of that bed will fry. So I really like going with this. Uh, so a lot of questions have come in. I guess I'll just say that the last thing is be sure, choose your lumber yourself. Look at each piece, choose straight non-warped pieces of lumber. And if you're not used to doing that, it can take time People who care about the, the outcome of their products will do that. So don't worry about looking funny standing there in the middle of the lumber aisle. Uh, it's very normal. And if you don't like a piece, put it back or some sometimes depending on how the, the lumber is set up, there's a place kind of a little bit off to the side. Just don't mix everything up different products, uh, but, but look at one piece at a time. And if you haven't done this before, basically what you do normally is you, you, uh, 
you put one piece of the lumber on the ground and holding it up, looking at it from kind of each side, look down the length of it, almost like you're looking down a pool cue. See if it warps, see if it cups. You, you won't always be able to find perfect, perfect lumber, but get the best you can, and then that will that will do well for you. Also look at the edges, make sure that there's not you know, huge cracks or anything like that. In today's cost in Southern California, each layer, not including the soil, which will be an expense as well, but just for the lumber, the corners and everything, uh, will cost about 40 bucks. So thinking about how many layers high you wanna go. Lumber is also really expensive right now because there's a lot of demand and the mills had cut back production going into the pandemic, not expecting the demand to be as strong as it has been. Uh, and so because each of these are five and a half inches tall for a typical raised bed, I do two layers, but if you wanna go taller, you can. And uh, you'll see in just a few minutes how you hold that together. So uh, a couple of, a few questions that have come in, and this is like kind of really important part of it. So let's take some time for some questions uh, from Susanna. Have I tested cedar? I have not. Cedar is is hard harder to get a hold of where I am in Southern California. Uh, my instinct is that it might uh, is that it might be similar to how what redwood performs, but I don't know for sure. Uh, from Jennifer, have I ever used a plastic liner that saves the wood? I have not because often with plastic liners, I become concerned uh, partially about drainage and also then what happens for the moisture that gets in between the wood and the plastic and not being able to breathe this much getting trapped in there. However, if you have had experience with using a plastic liner and it's worked really well for you, uh, I'd love to for you to put into the chat and uh, talk about it. Uh, do the blocks stay in place easily? I Yeah, exactly. I will show you in just a moment how you insert rebar into the corners. That's exactly what, what those holes are for to really keep things in place if you want to go that extra bit. Uh, uh, okay, from Amy, the Japanese char process. So you saw in, in one of my uh, pictures how the, the wood looked like it had been burnt. That is a process called shoshugiban, which has been used traditionally in Japanese construction, not necessarily for vegetables, uh, as, a, as a wood preservative. So when I did that, I was just testing to see if it would make a difference uh, long term. I did not live at that house long enough to really know, but I will say it took exponentially longer. Uh, and unlike other construction projects that I've used for fencing or things like that, uh, the ashes get all over the place for many months because you're leaning up against those raised beds. Uh, I, I didn't find any specific evidence that it would be worth continuing to do that. Uh, so I have not done that. Uh, from Sally, can you use Trex manufactured boards? That's like that, that plastic, uh, plastic kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, you can, if you want, it will last forever. Uh, However, it's going to be a lot, lot, lot more expensive. And I don't think it looks nice, personally. Uh, the Trek starts to fade in the sun after a little while. So it depends what your motivations are. But for me, I just, I just can't stomach the, the look of it. Uh, and the initial investment can be quite high. Uh, OK, let's see. Oh, and then that's also true. Uh, Jennifer mentioned Trex does bend in the heat. So you definitely can't do the thin Trex. You would need, if you were going to do that, you need to get the stuff that's like at least an inch and a half thick. It gets very expensive. Uh, okay, let's see. What about painting the outside with non-toxic paint? Uh, certainly there wouldn't be any huge issue for it. But again, I, I've, I like to maintain breathability. So there's going to be moisture on the inside. And that would, if it's painted on the outside, uh, then it's going to still be wet on the inside. And so I'd be worried that the wood would rot a little quicker. Uh, so Chuck recommended cut the wood at four feet. It's simpler than less, uh, less measuring than removing three and a half inches is the bed's just slightly larger. If you want to do that, you can. But the reason why I like to stick to a true four feet comes into irrigation layout and crop spacing later. So that's there's a specific reason why uh, I prefer to do it that way. But again, yeah, this is all what's going to work for you. 
So if that's not what you're into, don't worry about it. Uh, from Igor, how do you prevent rotting wood? Wood rots over time. Uh, so, you know, after seven, 10 years, you might have to replace some boards. Uh, so why I like this system is because there's a pretty good chance you can slide, not all the boards will be rotting. So you can slide some out and put some back in. But if you're working with a natural material, uh, that's going to happen over time. But what I like about it is, uh, what I like about it is that at the end of the lifespan, that'll just rot, it'll compost. You know, the, these cinder blocks will last pretty much forever. Whereas like with the plastic products or the metal products, that becomes landfill junk coming out of our garden over time. Uh, and to me, wood is a good balance of cost, longevity, aesthetics, ease of construction, uh, and the fact that, you know, at the end of the day, it basically can be ground up into mulch or green waste once, once it, it does uh, kind of reach its, its life limit. Uh, so recommended bed depth, uh, like we mentioned, most of the time for most gardens, I would go too deep on this about a foot high, unless you have a specific reason to go further. If you're just, if you have decent subsoil, uh, de or decent like garden soil, but you want the raised bed just to keep things a little bit more contained, uh, one high might be fine. But if you have other reasons that you're primarily growing in raised beds over soil underneath, whether it's rocky or really clay or anything like that, then two of these high, uh, getting into like supporting your back or things like that, three or maybe even four high. Uh, okay. Uh... Okay, so some questions about anchoring. We will uh, we will look at that in a second. Okay, from Sue, a lot of the wood you buy now is still damp. Do you, does do you find warping a problem? Absolutely. I've seen boards as they dry out, warp, uh, cup, and pop the screws off. That's why I like this system with the channels is because if the wood does try to warp, they stay kind of contained. And as much as they're going to warp, they're still contained in that channel. So you don't have those issues. Uh, so other kind of treating the lumber with asphalt or oil, same thing. I don't want that stuff in contact with my edibles. You might have a different uh, opinion, but for me, yeah, I don't want to mess with any of that stuff. I want to keep it natural. Uh, and are, so from Sarah, are these blocks suit enough to make uh, strong enough to make benches for sitting on. Uh, I guess it depends on how you would arrange them. I mean, they're used for retaining walls and things like that, but it, this is like narrow. So the channel is narrow. So yeah, I don't, I don't know. But I mean, they're concrete blocks. It's the same material as cinder blocks. They're very strong. So it depends on that architecture. And from Roberta, how to keep Bermuda grass and nut grass out of the garden. It's a whole other thing about weed abatement. Uh, it depends on where it's growing in your garden. If you have questions like at the end of the, the presentation, uh, we can spend time getting more specific about it. But in a raised bed vegetable garden, the main thing I recommend is mulching in between the beds and mulching with, uh, before you put down wood chip mulch, if you have a lot of pressure, multiple layers of just broken down cardboard boxes with a big overlap, like nine inches of overlap, maybe two layers of cardboard boxes or three layers deep, and then some wood chip mulch on top, and that will help smother the, uh, the ones. Uh, okay, so a few more questions. Uh, so you can still use a two by 12 board with two corner blocks. Yes, if you want to, you definitely can. Normally, uh, most lumber yards, that's gonna be a little bit more expensive to pay for that wider lumber versus two smaller ones. But if that's what you have or are motivated to do so, uh, you can do that. Uh, so from Cheryl, how about a box garden kit made of BPA-free plastic or composite material? Costco sells two four by four for 60 bucks. Uh, Normally those things to me are plastic stuff that's not going to last more than a couple of years and, and don't look good. I've, most of the things being sold at Costco or those kits or even like the cedar kits online, usually those are such thin material. Uh, they're being sold in box, box kits that can ship cheaply in a single cardboard box or two. Normally they, they don't hold up very long. 
auth. Okay. Uh, and I think that got us through most of the questions. Uh, Okay, last question from Susan, and then we're going to get moving on. But these have been great questions. Thank you, everybody, for sending them in. Are these blocks made to have just two slots and not four, so the corners are not as big? Now, this is how they come. They just kind of go either way. So that that is one of the things is uh, big corners, but that's by reducing the other dimensions a little bit. Uh, you can kind of save some of that space. Uh, but yeah, that is that's just kind of how they're made. Okay, so you can probably imagine this is kind of how it comes together. So this, these are pictures taken from when I did uh, this workshop in person at the Waterwise Community Center in our garage area in the past. So that's why it's just kind of in this concrete area and not a garden. And so what you wanna do is level the area in your garden out as much as possible. Uh, if you need to use a level, you can, but you know, with shovel, rake, depending on your soil, whatever you need to do, uh, the more you can invest in getting it level, uh, the nicer it's going to be long-term. But at a certain point, you know, it doesn't need to be perfect, perfect. It's not like you're pouring concrete, but just the, to the best of your ability. And then you can see just stacking them up, multiple layers, if you are going to be doing that. And then you can see here, so this hole in the middle is meant for a half inch piece of rebar. And basically at the end of the day, these things by the time they have wood in both channels are filled with soil are pretty much gonna stay in place. But really if you wanna, especially for the corners, keep them from being bumped or feel like you need to secure it more down into the soil, uh, you can, depending on your soil type, normally I would try to get a piece of rebar about a foot longer, at least six inches longer than, than the stack of these blocks that you're gonna have. And you would use a handheld metal, like four pound sledgehammer to hammer it in. Uh, just a normal hammer generally doesn't, doesn't uh, give you good force. And it's kind of hard to, to hit that with enough force to really drive that in. So hand, handheld sledgehammer is what you would normally use. Uh, and at most big box hardware stores, as well as other places that sell construction supply, you can get half inch rebar, sometimes it's called number four rebar, pre-cut to different sizes, like two feet and three feet are common. So depending on the height, either a two foot or a three foot piece in each corner pounded down. Obviously these are sticking out because it's on concrete. One just construction tip is don't get halfway through and leave these sticking up and not pound them down because at a stage like this, they're very hazardous. If someone trips for whatever reason and, and falls towards them, uh, that, that could be really bad. So put them in, pound them in right away. Uh, so yeah, that's basically what we are putting together. Pretty simple, goes together much, much faster and much stronger than uh, what might be called a quote, traditional raised bed plastic technique or raised bed uh, construction technique. So what are we gonna fill this with? Soil, soil, or soil? There's lots of different options for what to fill your waste bed with, but they're not always the same. There's no only one way to be successful, but there are some methods that I really don't recommend. The one thing I don't recommend is don't fill, no matter how tall or how short it is, do not fill your entire raised bed with bagged, quote, garden soil from a hardware store or nursery. Even though it says garden soil, there's no real soil in it. It's basically a, a, a broken down like forest, kind of like a semi-compost product. And what happens is over time that continues to break down to where, especially in like hot Southern California, over the course of a year, if you fill up a raised, one foot tall raised bed with all that quote, garden soil, even if it's the one from the hardware store in the bags that says it's four raised beds, if you fill up uh, a one foot raised bed with it after a year, two at the most, you'll probably only have six inches of soil left. And that soil will have actually degraded some instead of improving. Good practices in the vegetable garden, you should have better soil structure, everything better year after year. 
So you don't want to do that. That's also really expensive over time to keep topping it off. You also don't want to fill the entire bed with, with natural like soil, like real soil, even if it's good kind of sandy loam soil, just by kind of heaping it up in that raised bed, it, it tends to compact some. So you do want to add some extra organic matter. Ideally, you'll, you'll fill it with a mix of quote, like real soil that would at some point in time was taken out of the ground somewhere, even if you're buying it from the soil yard, uh, soil yards, kind of those landscape materials yards, uh, are the places where you can get real soil or real soil mixes, generally not at the hardware store. And so you want a mix of real soil and compost or soil amendment. Many soil yards sell a 50% sandy or sandy loam topsoil and 50% compost or amendment mix, 50%, 50% by volume. Sometimes it's called a raised bed mix or a special planter mix. Generally, go with this. And with this mix that you get, each one foot tall of a four by eight raised bed will require about one cubic yard of soil. So it can add up pretty quickly, just for kind of general reference. So one cubic yard, which is three feet by three feet by three feet, doesn't sound like that much. But once you kind of lay it out a little bit less tall, that's about what can fit in the back of my Toyota Tacoma pickup truck uh, filled all the way but the Toyota Tacoma that I have cannot haul that much weight at once. I can only do about half a yard of soil. If you have a bigger standard size truck, V8 engine, uh, you might be able to do a, a full yard of soil. And so for me, uh, it rapidly becomes, even though I have a truck going to the point where I'm going to have it delivered uh, because that's just a lot, a lot of back and forth. Uh, a standard kind of bag of soil from the hardware store is usually about one cubic foot. So it's about 27 of those bags to fill just a one foot tall four by eight raised bed. So you can see that that, that really adds up. If you have extra soil from your site and you have a nice like sandy or loamy soil, you can use that and then amend it with about 25, about one quarter to about one third compost, kind of mixing it in thoroughly all the way with a shovel. Uh, I've done that on projects and that normally works out even better than what you can get from the soil yard. And so a uh, few kind of images to show you what I'm talking about. And then I'll answer some of these questions that I've seen coming in because this is also a really important part of it. You wanna make sure you're starting with good stuff. And so, this is what I'm talking about for stuff that's not really soil. Uh, all sorts of different brands, but basically if it's in a, a plastic bag like this from the nursery or the hardware store, this is not real soil. Real soil has some amount of sand, silt, or clay in it. That's like the scientific definition. Oftentimes uh, somewhat of all three and your soil type is, is depending on the mix. Uh, these quote soil products, if you look at the ingredients, and sorry, this is just a zoom in uh, from the website, but the ingredients here are aged recycled forest products, aged arbor finds, basically ground up wood chips, then chicken manure, oyster shell, dolomite lime, basically uh, amendments. And so that's all organic. That can be great for soil amendment to add some organic matter in, but it's not what year after year you're crops are going to want to grow in. I mean, if, you, if you're doing gardening in like a couple of containers and fill it up because you're basically going to grow in a pot for a few couple of seasons and then need to replace the soil, that's fine. But for really setting up a system that's going to last long term, it's not what you want. It doesn't build over time it, it, and it'll be really expensive. And so this is kind of like what the mix might look like when it goes in. And in this case, uh, we ordered a 70% uh, soil, 30% compost mix, and it ended up being a little heavier than I was uh, wanting. So we then added some more compost and organic matter to it. And I will show you that process. And I'll also kind of show you some examples of compost and organic matter that might be suitable as we go in this example. But first, some questions. Uh, so some questions that it came in from Karen, could you use the higher rebar to string a trellis? Uh, if you wanted to do something like that, 
Normally, to really have a secure trellis, you either need a lot of rebar, so you need like rebar going all the way down the bed as well, or normally I'll use something stronger like a T post. And later on, I have I have uh, I have examples of different trellises. Uh, you might use the corners to set up some hoops if you wanted, but again, uh, kind of images later. Uh, so from Dr. Igor. Would, would I please repeat, what is the reason I cut each side of the box a little bit shorter? So with those concrete corners, because they are a little bit larger, if I want a true four foot width of my raised bed, then if I have a four foot piece of wood plus the extra little bit of the corners, it's gonna be a little bit wider. If that's easier for you, not the end of the world. But when I talk about irrigation and layout later on, it'll start to make sense why, for me, it just keeps it simple to keep it a true four foot width. It's also a little bit easier on the reach because you do add another like close to six inches if you don't cut some of that off, which can make it harder to reach the middle. But it, it kind of all works together as a system. And if it's not important to you, don't worry about it. Uh, so Kate had a suggestion for hammering in the rebar. Use a square piece of wood with a hole in it to slip the rebar on when using the sledgehammer. If you miss, you're less likely to damage the concrete block. Sounds like a good tip. Uh, so question came in about uh, fertilizers, uh, which we will get to in a little bit. Uh, okay, so have a lot of questions coming in in the chat. So I'm going to keep taking a look at these and answering all that I can, but it's easier for me to manage the questions coming in in the Q&A. So for everybody uh, who's putting in questions, uh, if you can click on the Q&A function when you're putting in uh, questions the, where the button that says Q&A and has little chat bubbles, that'll be easier for me to keep an eye on things. It, it just kind of managing it from my side uh, makes it harder for me to miss things. But I'll, I'll answer the questions I just saw coming in on the chat as well. So from Barbara, if I don't, if I don't have a truck, my soil is too weed seed filled to use, are there bag soils I could buy? So a number of soil yards, and those are basically landscape materials yards. You can type into Google uh, soil yard, landscape materials yards, or look in Yelp. Uh, they're basically businesses that sell soil mixes. Oftentimes they'll sell wood chip mulches and gravel as well. And they basically take soil, like often coming from construction sites, uh, that's definitely in Southern California, and then they'll mix it with amendments to make it suitable for things like they'll have mixes for raised vegetable gardens like this. So different than a hardware store. If you actually visit these places to pick them up, they're basically big dirt lots with piles of material and tractors and machines mixing things. Uh, so if you don't have a truck, what most people will do because of the large volume is these places do deliver as well. They charge a delivery fee, but basically they'll bring a dump truck to your site and wherever you tell them to dump it, whether it's in your driveway or, or on the street outside your house, uh, you know, they'll dump however much soil you need to order. So you tell them how much soil you need. And, uh, and a lot of them will help you figure out the dimensions as well, if you need help with that. And then you can go from there. Uh, some of them will sell these soils in bags. But if you're buying real soil, like a one or one and a half cubic foot bag of it can be like 50 pounds. It's a lot of weight to carry. So it's normally not practical if you don't have a truck to carry enough of that back and forth in a smaller car to do that. Normally, you're going to be having it delivered. Uh, but because you are also paying so much less, so okay, so per volume, this stuff is so much cheaper than the stuff you can buy at the hardware store. So even though you're paying a delivery fee, it's not necessarily going to be a most more expensive prospect, especially with the fact that you're not going to be losing that volume year after year that you would be from those mixes from the, the hardware store, the nursery that aren't true soil. Susanna asked, what about Mel's mix? I don't know what Mel's mix is. So if you wanna type back into the chat or Q and A with more uh, information or even like a link, and then at the end of the workshop, I can take a look at it and let you know what I think we can do that. Uh, okay. So I saw, 
So someone asked, if I have clay soil or heavier soil, what do you think about throwing in a layer of logs and branches in the bottom? So the idea would be to uh, increase the drainage. Honestly, I'm not that big of a fan of those techniques because the bottom part will have increased drainage, but that's not where your roots are. So if you need to increase the drainage qualities of your soil, the only way to really do that is going to be like with compost that's going to be mixed in and will build soil structure over time. Just drainage in the bottom basically will have roots growing in soil that doesn't drain at the top. And then all of a sudden it'll hit something that drains quickly, which roots won't want to grow in, but will separate those roots from eventually getting into the lower uh, subsoil, even if it's not perfect subsoil. So I know some people do that. If people are successful with that, I'm not going to tell you, you know, that all those people are wrong because again, there's so many different ways to do it. But the, I'll say that through the way that I look at gardening, uh, I would not find that to be uh, the advantageous way to go. Okay, so let's keep going. So in this example, so we brought in our soil from the soil yard, but still found that, that it was a little bit heavier uh, than we wanted. We added to use, we, we wanted to use more compost. So here is an example of compost. If you live close to us, uh, in kind of the western edge of San Bernardino County, eastern edge of Los Angeles County, we actually have a free mulch and compost giveaway program. Mulch is pretty much always available in our parking lot. You can just come and pick up as much as you, you need in a pile. We get a big load of compost delivered once a month. We announce it on our social media, which you can find out about and follow uh, information. There's on our website, or you can find out through our newsletter. And this is kind of what we give away. So we added a wheelbarrow of this. Normally, if I'm working with uh, soil that is, you know, kind of okay, but I'm getting my bed going for the first time, I will do a pretty thick, like three to four inch layer evenly forked in. So here is that. Uh, if you're working with raised beds and need to really add quite a bit, two people with the wheelbarrow just dumping the whole thing in can uh, make things a lot easier. Using a bow rake or a hard tooth rake to kind of rake it out. If you don't have one and you just have like a flat shovel, you can do that. And then we also use some other materials just to show things that can work. This all natural garden soil is basically uh, not quite broken down compost but then with nutrients added into it. I'm fine with using that as a soil amendment. And to get things going, I'll, normally I won't use all like a ton of this stuff, which is kind of a premium soil amendment product because it can get quite expensive but I will use some. And so this is just one uh, that I will use sometimes. And the reason why I will use some of this is because if I brought in soil from a soil yard, which is basically from a construction site, it's been sitting for, I don't know how long, uh, it, the soil's kind of been through some trauma. And so in good, healthy soil, there's gonna be lots of microbial activity, beneficial, bacteria and fungus that have all sorts of benefits in the soil for cycling nutrients, helping protect from disease. Uh, it's just really a, a crucial uh, part of productive soil ecosystems. In normal good soil, like in your yard, that stuff is going to be there anyways. Uh, there are lots of companies making more of a big deal about this and saying you should always plant with it uh, than is really necessary because in normal situations, that stuff is generally going to be there is kind of what a lot of studies have shown. But I know this soil, because of it coming from a soil yard and its history has kind of been through some of that trauma and I just don't know. So to kind of ensure that things are getting off to a good start, a lot of these premium, whether it's a fertilizer or an amendment product have these beneficial soil microbes mixed in. Uh, if you are going to be doing this, so for me, I will, I will use this just the first time I am doing doing amendment. I won't be adding the stuff back in every year because if the soil is in good condition, this stuff is just gonna continue living there. It's not like you need to keep adding it back in. It's not like a nutrient, like the stuff will be in there. It will multiply, it'll keep going. If, you, if a product that has the stuff is reputable, it will literally tell you like how many organisms usually per gram of soil are in there. You don't need to understand like what, but it's basically, it's telling you what's in there. Some products will just say like, yeah, it's in there. Take our word for it. So that is 
just one example of then kind of using a little bit of this, spreading it out and then forking it in. So if you have a digging fork, that works great. And so what you want to make sure you're doing if you're amending for the first time, the first time you're setting up your beds, you want to make sure that you're mixing this stuff in uh, evenly throughout the whole depth of at least the top foot of your raised bed. If you have a two foot raised bed, it's not gonna be practical to go all the way down. Eventually some of that organic material with worms showing up and stuff like that will mix itself in. So about a foot down is practical. So with the digging fork, like the depth of the digging fork, and you wanna make sure you don't just lift it up and invert it. So all the amendments at the bottom and the soils at the top, you wanna to kind of shake things around uh, so that it all gets mixed in. So you can do that with the digging fork or with a flat shovel. If you need to, I prefer the fork, but if you just have a couple of raised beds, you might not wanna buy one. And then you'll end up with something like this, which then you wanna rake as evenly as possible. You can use the teeth of the, of the rake to kind of break up the clods, just kind of like up and down with the rake, kind of breaking them some. Uh, raking them to the side. You don't want to pulverize everything so that it's tiny, tiny, tiny. Uh, you can leave some, but just kind of getting it like that. And at a certain point, you'll go from using the teeth of the rake to go to the back to kind of smooth it out some. And so I see a lot of questions coming in. What I want to do is get through nutrients and fertilizers uh, because it's also kind of related. And then I will get back to answering the questions that have come in. So nutrients and fertilizers. Fertilizer products will list the numbers on the fertilizer as you'll see three numbers, five by five, 16, 12, 16, something like that. Those three always come in the same order, which is NPK is what you'll hear. So the first number is for nitrogen and that supports vegetative plant growth. The second number is phosphorus, which supports roots, flowering, and fruit. And the third number is potassium, which supports overall plant function and performance, including disease resistance. This is just good for you to know. You don't necessarily need to memorize that. Just know that those are different nutrients. What I recommend in general is that you use any good quality fruit and vegetable organic fertilizer. And so common brands from local nurseries and hardware stores, at least in our region, are Down to Earth, Dr. Earth, Kellogg, uh, EB Stone is another one. And for those organic fertilizers, the numbers are going to be something like 444, 462, 463 for that NPK. That's kind of the range of an organic fertilizer. So you'll see like miracle grow 12, 12, 12 or something, you know, 20, 20, 20, those really high numbers. I do not recommend those for home gardeners for a number of reasons. And this doesn't even necessarily have to do anything with whether or not you're an organic gardener. Organic gardening is, is a great way to go, but beyond those general reasons to do organic gardening, I recommend that home gardeners use organic fertilizers for a couple of reasons. The first one is that those high potency chemical fertilizers, the, the ones with the really high numbers, if you use a little too much, you can damage your plants and you can damage your soil. If you use a little too much of these lower potency organic fertilizers, because there's lower potency and because of their inherent slow release because of how organic fertilizers work in the soil, all you'll do is use a little more fertilizer than you need and maybe you have to buy a little bit more. You're not going to damage your plants. Big one for home gardeners. Second one is that the chemical fertilizers are proportionately, that fertility is like ready to go instantly available in the soil in a more water soluble form and then can be washed out of the soil much quicker with irrigation or rain, which depending on where you are, could cause nutrient runoff issues and water pollution issues. In addition, it's salty. 
And so overuse of it over too many years can cause salinity issues in the soil, which can not only be bad for your plants, but also the soil microbiology. The organic fertilizers, on the other hand, are inherently slow release. They need to kind of go through the soil food web process before they then slowly become in a plant available form, which is good for the soil microbiology, generally has less salinity issues over time and supports the whole soil ecosystem. And so our goal is to build soil over time to a better, more disease resistant soil year after year. And the organic fertilizers, both in the short term and the long term, really support that a lot better. For the quantity to apply, the package will have directions. It'll say like this many cups or this many pounds per, you know, what, however many square feet. So generally follow that. I sometimes don't, especially if I've have some compost, I've built some organic matter. I generally don't fertilize quite as much as the packages recommend, but I will use their rates. Generally what I'll do is I will fertilize like right before or during the planting process. And then I will do it again mid season to give the crops a boost. Generally uh, that's all, all fertilized twice a year. I will say that a lot of casual home gardeners add a little bit of compost. Maybe they're composting some at home and call it a day on soil fertility. And they don't use fertilizer like this or have like any schedule, like they're gonna do it at planting and partway through the season. I think that and that kind of attention to soil fertility as well as watering in Southern California are the main barriers between casual gardeners really getting good production. This is not scientific. This is just kind of based on my observations over many years and working with many gardeners and answering lots of questions. Your natural soil in your area might be different than ours, but if you're in Southern California, whether you're gardening in loam or sand or clay, most of our soils have pretty good nutrients in everything except nitrogen, which is very critical for making plants grow. And so even if we have our compost, especially if you're home composting, or even if you buy compost, there's a lot of great micronutrients. There is some nitrogen, but you generally don't know exactly what the nutrient qualities are of that. And so using a balanced fertilizer, kind of a gentle organic fertilizer, like this sort of stuff is kind of the insurance that you're going to have everything you need, including the nitrogen. I've done lots of soil testing on different projects that I've done in Southern California over the years. And in most cases, uh, that's basically what we find is that it's pretty good on things except for nitrogen. So that's where that fertility comes in. If you are growing in an area where you think there might have been like lead paint nearby based on the age of the property, location to the house, a site that used to be an industrial site or something like that, definitely by all means, send in a soil test. They'll tell you what you need in terms of amendments, but also they will tell you uh, if there are heavy metals or other toxicity issues if you ask for that test. And where you send it's gonna be different depending on where you live. Uh, here in Southern California, there's a soil, I think soil and plant lab is a main one in Orange County and there's Wallace Laboratories in El Segundo are our two main ones. But again, it's gonna be different depending on where you are, but you can generally look up like soil testing and your location in Google and find some options. So this just happens to be one example of a fertilizer that we're using. Again, it has this stuff in it. Most of the organic fertilizers will have some of these beneficial soil organisms. And then you can see different instructions. And if your garden is mixed, they won't all give you like different instructions for different uh, crops, but you can see it kind of mixes one cup per 10 square feet of growing area, one and a half cups. So, you know, go somewhere in between or just do it at a little bit higher rate. Since most of the time you're eventually figuring it out by cups, I just keep a measuring cup in with my fertilizers, kind of sprinkle it out and just lightly rake it in. And then 
gentle watering just to kind of activate everything. After this first setup, I am a big supporter of what's called no dig gardening, which basically means that in future seasons, whether you're adding compost or fertilizers, you're only adding it at the top with the fertilizer maybe doing that gentle raking it in some. But you're never again going to do that deep digging and mixing and mixing up of the soil. The reason why is because after this, we're going to start to build soil structure in our beds. And by we, I mean collectively, because we as the humans can't actually do it. But as plant roots grow, as they die back, as they exude some of the compounds that they exude, as earthworms come through, as soil beneficial fungus and bacteria are there, they're actually going to be changing the structure of the soil molecules and improving its capacity to hold water, hold air, and hold nutrients. We are basically in this first season setting everything in motion. But if we then dig deeply after that, unless we have a very specific reason too, which are few and far between, we are going to be then collapsing some of that newly built soil structure. We are going to be inverting the layers of the microorganisms that are living in the soil, some of which are pretty sensitive to how close to the surface they are. And once you get that going, by adding the compost just to the top, it will be mixed in by the critters over time. And so it also makes less work for us. Occasionally, if there's a specific reason, you know, if you think after the first year, I really do need to try to get some more organic matter in deeply, uh, you can do that. But, but what you wanna try to get to is get to the point where you're not digging each year. That's gonna be the only way to really build that optimal soil structure and it's less work for us. And so just from the top and just kind of scratching in that fertilizer a little bit if you want to. And so with that, we're gonna move on from here to talking about uh, some vertical support trellises and things like that. But we have some questions. Uh, okay, from Cromilda. I apologize if I am mispronouncing your name. How about spreading the slow release fertilizers in the beds before planting? Roots can spread instead of staying where it planted. Uh, yes, absolutely. That's exactly what I do. So this is leading up to planting. And so when I do spread fertilizers, uh, I will generally spread it over the whole bed to be fertilizing the whole bed. Uh, the only exception to that is with tomatoes. I might toss in a little bit when I'm planting uh, just to give them a boost, but generally just like this, spreading it over the whole bed. What about using a tarp, walking it up and down to mix the soil and then adding it to the bed instead of raking? Uh, to me, I think that that would make it more work in the long run, but if that's what you wanna do, again, there's no hard and fast rules. Uh, if, if you think that'll be more efficient for your situation, then go for it. From Susanna, uh, was talking about some other amendments for the square foot gardening method. If, that what is, if that's what, is working well for you, you can go ahead and do it. Personally, uh, I am not a fan of that uh, mix. I, I like if I think about a 20 or 30 year horizon for wanting to build soils in my beds, there's no, there's no substitute for real soil mixed with good quality organic matter. I do see that some people are raising their hands. Uh, for those of you who weren't with us at the beginning of the workshop, I had mentioned, please type your questions into the Q&A because with a large group, we have 87 people here. Uh, calling on people with their hands raised uh, does not uh, work very well for just the downtime with the audio and other issues that we, we sometimes have. Uh, so from Mary Ann, Testing the soil and getting your results in the MPK numbers, is that what you use to determine the kinds of fertilizer based on the numbers of the bag? Good question. So this is where I think like agricultural theory uh, meets like what we actually would do as home gardeners. I certainly have had projects, especially like big, like if I'm planting a hundred fruit trees, certainly get your soil tested, see exactly what that soil needs. 
if you have two raised beds coming from a reputable like soil company and a reputable soil company is aware of where they're sourcing their soil from, should be doing occasional soil tests. Uh, and you can ask them to see soil tests and, and how they you know make sure that their soil is clean as well on the phone and they should have a good answer for you. Uh, most of the time, depending on where you are, uh, you're gonna need a little boost of like that, maybe not all NPK, but at least one of those. In a lot of areas, it's the nitrogen. And it's not practical for most home gardeners who just need like one little box of fertilizer a year to source out like, instead of a general uh, vegetable fertilizer, well, if I only need nitrogen, I'm only gonna get like cotton seed meal, for example, and then can I get organic cotton seed meal? And then that one thing, which is a specialty product is only available in the 50 pound bag. and so. Normally at the end of the day, if you just have a couple of raised beds, maybe test it if you're you know, really concerned about building all of that the first time. Uh, some people will, some people won't, but you, you don't need to do it on a regular basis. Each soil test is gonna cost you 70 to hundred bucks. And so again, it's the whole like, what are you putting in? What are you getting out of it? If you are going to be growing all of the vegetables for yourself and your family and raising kids in that critical kind of nutrition time of their, their life, then yeah, make sure you have everything uh, in that soil. And that's great. But for most people who are just gonna grow one or two raised beds, just a, a normal mix kind of, you know, a 444, 464 uh, vegetable garden, organic fertilizer will have everything. It might have a little bit more, but it's not gonna cause any issues because of the nature of those organic fertilizers. And it's easier to get a hold of. With fertilizers, you basically, pay by volume, especially with any brand. So a four pound box, which is a, a common size at the nursery or hardware store is going to be significantly more expensive per pound than like the next size, which is a 12 or sometimes 20 pound bag, which is going to be significantly more expensive per pound than if you get up to like a 50 pound bag of the same product. Depending on the products, they have it available at different sizes. The local nursery or the hardware store generally won't have a 50 pound bag. And it depends on the size. If you just have one raised bed, it might not be practical to do anything other than get that little four pound box put in your garage. Because my partner and I have a large uh, vegetable area, we will actually special order uh, 50 pound bags of a brand that we like, which is available at the local nursery, just not as large through a local hydroponics store, which happens to carry that brand because it is so much cheaper to buy it in the 50 pound bag. And then we will take it out of that and put it into five gallon buckets with uh, lids that fit well. So, you know, critters aren't attracted to it because sometimes critters can kind of smell it, be attracted to it. And because we have a large uh, garden that saves us quite a bit of money on the fertilizer. Uh, and then last question on fertility the, uh, that, uh, do you ever use any type of aged manure for increasing nitrogen levels? Uh, so some people, I mean, you can do that, uh, with manures, you need to be careful. They can be very salty. So the age definitely helps aged and leached with water, uh, is even better but it depends where you are. So if you're in an area where you have easy access to it, something worth considering. If you're in the Southern California suburbs, uh, I would not bother seeking that out versus using the organic fertilizers for those nitrogen levels. Uh, okay, and uh, last question from Connie. There are a lot of small roots underneath the soil from previous plants. If I don't dig deep, do I just leave them there? Good question. If the roots are small enough that they're not going to cause a problem with future planting or seeding, and you haven't been dealing with any like real disease issues, absolutely, I leave them there. That's compost in place. It'll just rot down over time, add organic matter to the soil. So oftentimes what I'll do is like, if I'm removing tomatoes, squash, something like that, I will use either a shovel or more often like a lopper, uh, to just cut the, the major roots and remove it. And I'll leave all the small roots in the ground to rot down. If when I'm planting, there's a little too much in the way, I'll just dig out a little bit more. But in general, by the time I am doing my replanting, uh, there's not that much, even if I'm just like going into the next season, just if there's stuff in the way, other than that, 
that's all fertilizer in place. And that's how I get some of that deep organic matter because I'm no longer turning the soil is by leaving plant roots to break down. Okay, so what I wanna do is get through, I think just this next section about planting uh, for vertical support and growing, and then we will take our quick break because we still have so much to cover, a lot of great questions, but we need to keep going to make sure that you get all the information that I uh, want you to be able to have. So if your plants are gonna be growing well in your raised beds and you're growing larger plants, especially tomatoes, cucumbers, pole beans, uh, even some of the smaller melons or squash that can be trellised up, peas, you're gonna need to really seriously plan for some support. The stuff that they sell at the hardware store in the nursery for trellising usually in the nursery aisle isn't worth that much. Like tomato cages, if you have healthy tomatoes, they're useless. Your tomatoes are gonna to wanna to get six or eight feet tall. Uh, those little things don't do much. And so plan for support and vertical growing. You can get great stuff at the hardware store for that, but it's not gonna be in the nursery aisle normally. It's construction materials. And it's worth it to invest in sturdy materials that are going to last. So things like working with T posts, which I'll show you in a minute, well, they are cattle panels, real lumber, like four by four uh, lumber, deer fence, concrete reinforcing mesh, or even thick bamboo or rebar are good materials to work with. If you're working with T-posts, which I'll show on the next slide, make sure you're gonna want them where you put them in because they are hard to remove. And so this is one of the raised beds in my yard, and this is our trellising system. So these are T-posts. They're called T-posts because if you are looking directly down on them, there's it kind of forms a T with the steel. They're hidden with a metal post pounder and they stay in place. They have like a little almost like shield or cross piece on the bottom that really anchors them in and they are very sturdy. You can get them at the local hardware store, but sometimes you actually need a, a taller one uh, they often only have them like five or six feet at the local hardware store to get enough sticking out to really cover my trellises. These are shorter, but sometimes for taller ones uh, around me, the tractor supply company, which I need to drive a little bit farther out of my local area into a, a little bit more agricultural area. Uh, for those of you in Southern California, I go to the one in Norco. I, uh, you can get them like up to 10 feet tall. I end up using eight foot ones for my taller trellises. And then this, is also from Tractor Supply Company. It's called a cattle panel. And it's basically just a kind of thick welded wire. And it comes in these panels like this. So they're already pretty straight. I used to build these with deer fencing, which you can get a roll of at the hardware store, but then you need to roll them out, kind of straighten them up. And they are a little bit uh, less thick in terms of the metal. If that's what you have access to, go ahead and go for it. I've, I worked with those for years because I used to work, uh, live when I was living in Altadena, I just had to drive really far to get these kind of more agricultural supplies. Uh, so use what you can, but what you're thinking about is something with, with a heavy, you know, as heavy as practical gauge of metal and a large enough opening so you can kind of reach your hand through to harvest from either side or kind of tie things up pretty easily because the weight of productive vines will, will get pretty significant. And also these thicker materials aren't going to rust out right away. They will last for years. And so what I do is in my beds where I might not want to have a trellis all the time, I have these sturdy T-posts and then I just wire them on in the corners and then the T-posts will always be there. I can remove the trellising as I want or if I'm doing a crop rotation to not grow the same plant in the same bed every year we can move around which beds have the trellises, but leave the posts, which are a lot of work to get in and out. Someone asked what this white flower is. This is just what happens if you let a carrot grow up and go to flower. And we'll always leave a few of those because the beneficial insects love them. Uh, so these are just carrots that from the last year doing that kind of grew up in the path. And we just left them for flowers because they're pretty, the birds like to eat the seed, beneficial insects like them. And then we'll harvest some of the carrots that just grow up here and there randomly and leaves them to flower. So that's one example. Here's another example that is quite nice. This is probably used for growing squash like up and over. These are concrete reinforcing mesh, I believe. Uh, so that's like a slightly lighter gauge than the cattle panels, uh, but more readily available, normally in the concrete section of the hardware store. 
different sizes, pretty easy to cut with a wood frame. Here's another example of, this is a really nice, really thick, some sort of agricultural uh, like fencing panel that this is just the garden I saw in Northern California, still using t post You can see they just tied it on with twine. I wouldn't know where to get this exact product, but if I did, uh, then I'd probably buy it. So it's just about what, what you have available to you. So what I'm going to do is now it is 10.50. Let us take just a five minute break. Okay, welcome back everybody. So let's start with some questions and then get back into it. So from Karen, if my bed is next to a wooden fence, what's the best way to use the fence itself as a support? Good question. Uh, it's gonna depend on where the posts are. You're probably not going to wanna rely on like the individual fence panels uh, for much actual support because oftentimes they're just nailed in and if there's much weight on it, they could like pull them out. But the fence itself is probably supported by either like four by four or metal poles. And you can use that. If you want to, you can get some eye bolts into that or some other sort of bolting or even like another four by four out on the side, just something to anchor into that. And you can pull wire across or use that to put up some, one of these sort of like uh, fencing panels. That would be the sorts of things I would start to think about. And remember, if you're gardening right up against the fence, you probably don't want to do a four foot deep bed because you can only reach from one side. What I would do is either a two foot deep bed or sometimes what I'll do to make it more practical if you have room is a three foot deep bed up against the fence and strategically put stepping stones like every number of feet. So you have a spot if you need to get one foot into there, it's just, you're, it's always the same spot. You're not compacting the soil and you can just kind of get part way in and do some other work. Uh, the last panel looks like fencing, maybe hog wire. Yeah, a lot of those things are called different things, hog wire, cattle panels, things like that. Just depends on the manufacturer where it's being sold. Uh, so Miriam came in late wondering if it's available as a video later. Yeah, so this is gonna be on our YouTube channel. I'm gonna do some light editing of just downtime at the beginning. And then by midweek next week, I'm gonna type into the chat now. So it'll be at cbwcd.org slash YouTube for the whole presentation. Uh, so from Sarah, a question about roots. For So for any plant, Sarah, you want those roots to grow far and wide uh, because that's how the plant basically is designed to be able to not only have structural support, but where it can, it can pull like uh, water and nutrients from. So I think what you're getting at is like, sometimes if a, a plant's been in the pot for too long, which we'll look at in a moment, the roots are just kind of spiraling around the small area. Uh, yeah, it, it, that's just not how roots really uh, work. And it can kind of basically strangle itself instead of going far and wide, getting the water and nutrients it needs. Uh, so from Connie, if I leave the small roots in the soil, the soil will eventually be filled with all of them. As a result, there's no soil for the plants to grow on. Do I keep adding the soil every once in a while? Uh, the small roots, if everything is going well, those small roots in the soil after no more than a season are going to rot. They're going to break down. They're going to turn to compost. Uh, where I've seen exceptions to this is in very small beds, especially with potting soil, where I, I'm not going to get into kind of the, I guess my like theory behind it based on the science, but, but things might not break down as quickly. But I mean, I've been doing this for years and years and years, uh, and I've never had the issue in a raised bed or in the ground bed with real soil that the the small roots just like keep persisting year after year. Uh, there's going to be a cycle and eventually they can break down. And then the soil, you shouldn't have to add more soil. Again, if you're not working with just the potting soil, if you're working with the real soil, you might add compost every once in a while just on the top to kind of add a little bit more organic matter, uh, keep the biological activity ha happy, but you shouldn't be losing volume as well. Uh, but if there's ever too many roots in the way, you know, dig some out, that's fine. Uh, so here in Riverside County, if I plant a raised bed right up to the property divider cement block wall, will it burn the plants in the hotter weather? 
in general, uh, you should be okay if you choose the right plant for the right place, plant it at the right time of the year and water appropriately. Now, if it's facing west or south with a lot of reflected heat, big beefsteak tomatoes, maybe. Uh, bell peppers, maybe. But that's the same. I'm in Pomona for basically any real full sun area. That's why I don't bother growing bell peppers. And I mostly will grow uh, some cherry tomatoes uh, because they're a lot easier to grow and less likely to burn in our extreme heat. So it, I think it comes down more to your crops. Uh, grow the right crop in the right season and make sure your crops are adapted to hot inland areas. Uh, from Connie, when and how often do I apply the fertilizer? So most of the time it's, it's at or right before planting and about halfway through the season to give things a boost are, are, my, recommend, are my recommendations. Uh, okay, so with that, uh, someone, Ayano has no sound right now. I believe everyone else can hear. So, and it looks like through Zoom it's going, so I will type in. Seems to be working. I guess we'll just one or two people type into the chat uh, just to confirm that you can hear me. And then I will keep going. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's get going. So we've talked about building the raised bed. We've talked some about soil. We've talked some about fertility. Now we need to start talking plants. Starting with trying to help you out, uh, guiding you through buying seeds and starts because there's a lot of confusion. And it's so important to start with good quality, especially if you're buying starts material and only buy starts of plants that are, are good at being transplanted from from starts. I see so many people struggling because they've paid good money for crummy products uh, that are just never going to be happy. So what to look for in your starts if you're buying starts. Some crops I will recommend buying starts. Some crops I will recommend buying seeds. What to look for in starts are healthy, vigorous, smaller plants. The big plant isn't necessarily the big value. You don't want your plant to be that much bigger than the, the little uh, root and soil portion of your starts. Uh, with tomatoes, they can stretch a little bit more, but it's not a lot of people think this one is super tall, super big for the size, it's a great deal. That's something that is not gonna grow much. It's, it's overgrown. Uh, healthy, vigorous, smaller plants. I would only recommend for most plants buying like four, what are called four inch, or sometimes they're like, uh, quart sized plants. Uh, and I'll show you some, some examples on the next page. Uh, or pony packs, which are those little six packs. Those pony packs are generally good for like uh, greens or things like that. But most of the things that I will actually buy and not just start from seed because it's easier and cheaper will come in four inch plants. Uh, I'll often buy uh, tomatoes, or peppers in the summer. Those are actually really, or eggplant. Those are actually really the main thing. Most other things I'll start from seed, to be quite honest. Uh, avoid anything with yellowing leaves. Those are ones that have been in those pots for long enough that they're experiencing some nutrient deficiency issues, or there's something off with the soil, or they've been over irrigated, or something like that. Yellowing leaves are not a good sign. Avoid ones that have fruit already. That's not a good deal. Plants need to grow large before they start developing fruit. Basically plants photosynthesize. They develop a certain amount of carbohydrates which they can use to grow or fruit. And if they start fruiting too young, they're not gonna grow and then give you a bunch of fruit. So in fact, when plants, until plants have put on a lot of growth, I will pull off the first few fruits. I will pull off some flowers even to make sure that they, they get big and bushy or big and tall. And then I get a lot of fruit later on. It's delayed gratification, but it is so essential. And so generally avoid plants with fruit. Ideally avoid plants with flowers. However, it is very common for peppers, tomatoes, or eggplants to sometimes have a couple flowers or a couple flower buds. Just pinch those off. 
you really want all of those, like you want your tomatoes to be a number of feet tall before you really start letting them flower. So at transplanting uh, and even like, I, so this year uh, we invested, uh, we've been at our place for about two years. We invested in really having our own like great propagation setup, growing our tomatoes from seed and stuff this year. Even now we, we haven't transplanted yet and we have a few early flowers. We're just picking them off. Uh, so that's totally normal coming from the nursery, especially for tomatoes. Uh, but we will continue to do that until those plants are in the ground and a number of feet tall. So it doesn't start putting its energy into fruiting yet. You need it to grow for a while. Take a look at the drainage holes on the little pots. Avoid plants with a lot of roots coming out of the drainage holes at the bottom. Just seeing a couple of roots is fine, but any indication that, that things are really kind of root bound. And if you suspect they might be overgrown, gently pull the plant out of the plastic pot and look at the roots. If there are tons and tons of like tightly spiraling roots at the edge, going all the way around the whole little root ball, that's something that's that's not worth buying. Uh, buy buy something younger. Go to a different nursery, something like that. Uh, and and oftentimes it's you know it's not going to be like there'll be a number of flats of different varieties at the nursery. And sometimes you might just want to find ones that are healthier or younger looking. It's not like they're all going to be in the same condition at the nursery. But just because of the economics of it, they will keep things and keep selling them too long and uh, or sometimes too early. So here's an example on the right of something that I wouldn't do. This is like a jumbo size uh, plant being sold for seven bucks. That's too much for, for one plant. You can get it a little bit smaller in a four inch pot or a quart pot it should be like four bucks and it's gonna turn into something this size in like a week. Uh, so here are examples of things that I would absolutely avoid at the nursery. You see how purple and yellow this is? That's a nutrient issue. And that's not because it's this one's certified organic, that's just because it's not been grown in good conditions or it hasn't been treated well when it's at the nursery. These were examples of the nursery section of a big box hardware store. Uh, pepper leaves already showing some signs of early disease, skip it. You want only bring healthy plants into your garden. Uh, here you can see undersized. Here you can see on the right, uh, a little bit oversized maybe, not the end of the world specifically because just a trick for tomatoes, you can pinch off the side uh, leaves and plant like even up to, if you can see where my mouse is, like even up to here in the ground because all the little hairs on the tomatoes are fuzzy. All of these will turn into roots. You could plant them deep. Uh, and one thing I would absolutely avoid, here they're advertising, this is grown with miracle Grow. That means that in the nursery, it's been getting a ton of fertilizer. Once you put that into the ground in your healthy organic system, it's gonna be more of a slow, steady release of nutrients, which is good. If you put these plants that have been grown with all this miracle grow in there, they're going to sulk because they, they're, they're kind of like all juiced up. What that means is that you have to keep putting the miracle grow on, keep putting that miracle grow on. And sometimes when you do that, there's too much fertility. You get a big plant and not a lot of fruit anyways. It's not good for your soil long term. So to me, even though they're advertising this, that means I'm staying clear of it. Uh, Thank you for the comment from Camilda. She recommended that people don't buy plants at big box stores to put local nurseries. I always uh, recommend that as well. Depending on where people live, they have uh, different opportunities to do that or not. Uh, so here, this is, again, I would not grow this. I would not uh, purchase this plant. These just happen to be all from one trip and I was trying to get good pictures for this presentation. Like this grown with miracle growth thing, enough for me, non-starter, not gonna get that plant. But just to look at the size and the color of the plant, this is about what you're looking for in terms of a, a four inch tomato plant. But uh, yeah, local nurseries, if you could buy plants grown organically, that's ideal. Sometimes you can't always do that. Uh, local nurseries, good quality is what you wanna go for. So. I mentioned some plants are good to plant from starts. Some plants are not. Many plants that will be sold as starts are easier and healthier to grow from seed. So for example, 
beans, peas, zucchinis, squash, melons if you're going to grow melons, uh, all of those plants, not only zucchini, all of these plants not only hate root disturbance, which makes them harder to transplant, they're all extremely easy and extremely fast to grow from just sticking the seed in the ground at the right spacing. So I will always do that and always recommend it. It's cheaper, you get healthier, more productive plants. Now, some of you will probably say, well, I bought those before I've been successful. If that's the case for you, I'm not telling you, you can't do it. I've seen it happen, I've seen it be successful, but in general, they're harder to transplant, they thrive less, and they're just so easy to do from seed that there'd be no reason not to. So sources for seeds and starts. For a small casual gardener, for growing things from seed. To get in the mail kind of ordering from, from uh, what I consider the best seed producers with the most interesting varieties is not always, I guess I'll say like economically, it doesn't always make sense for someone who just has one or two raised beds because these are small companies. It's not like, uh, you know, Amazon free shipping arrives in two days. Uh, these companies need to charge for shipping to be able to make a living. Uh, and so if you just need a couple of packets of seeds, sometimes it's not worth it. Uh, definitely if you're involved with like a community garden, have a gardening group, maybe you all can like pitch in, do, a, do an order together. That makes sense. Uh, oftentimes it's like flat rate shipping. So it's like nine bucks to ship some seeds, but then you can order quite a few. Uh, so for smaller casual gardeners, there are a couple of brands of seeds that I think produce good quality seeds, have decent varieties, and I've been very successful with on projects where I've ended up using them. Uh, as long as they are displayed and stored well at the nursery. So basically, if you're at a nursery and the where the seeds are, are like either outdoors or they're indoors, but in a bright window where it's full blasting sun on the packets, I'll avoid those. That's not good storage for seed and long-term seed viability. Around here in Southern California, there's a few brands and normally I don't like to recommend specific brands, but I do want to set you up for success. A, a lot of what are at the hardware stores are junk. Uh, there's a few brands that, that I think work well. Uh, at Armstrong, like the local uh, franchise, uh, Botanical Interests is a company that they carry a lot of and they have some good seeds or other local nurseries, sometimes botanical interests or also Renee's garden seed are both ones that, that are, you know, they do a good job, uh, been pretty successful with. For a larger or ambitious garden, if you're working with other people, here are some, what I consider the top seed sources available online. I'm really a huge fan of Johnny's selected seeds, not only for the quality of their seed and their catalog, but they have really, really incredible information. A lot of the kind of small organic farm selling at farmers markets or doing market gardening, get seeds from them. And they're really good at, at giving information about what varieties are good for, uh, disease resistance, harvesting, all that sort of stuff. Uh, Peaceful Valley Farm Supply has some other good quality seed as well, as well as other organic gardening stuff. If you're interested in growing Asian vegetables, especially the different choys and Asian greens, but also getting into like cucumbers and eggplants. Uh, Kitazawa Sea Company, based in the Bay Area, has really great catalog and varieties. And then also interesting, tough varieties of a lot of greens, but other things as well, is Wild Garden Seed, which I believe is based in the Northwest, are different online companies to check out. And then for buying starts, uh, locally around where we are in Southern California, Armstrong Gardens in Claremont, Glendora Gardens in Glendora, and the Cal Poly Pomona Farm Store are the, are the best places I know of. Unfortunately, in a lot of our communities, a lot of the small nurseries have gone out of business. And so it's, it's fewer and farther between to find places to get good stuff in a lot of our communities. Uh, a little bit farther into the San Gabriel Valley, uh, Lincoln Avenue Nursery in kind of like the Pasadena Altadena border also does a really good job. And then Gloria typed in San Diego Seed Company as another seed company. I've heard of them. I don't have much experience with them, but thank you. I'll have to check them out. So top sources. And then in terms of like spacing, 
planting depth, things like that. I have references later on in the presentation that just kind of break down the recommendations for all the different plants. Uh, so I'll talk about that when I get to them. In general, just kind of general, I won't say a rule, but a general guideline uh, in terms of seed depth is about three times the depth of like the, the width of the seed itself or the height of the seed itself. So, you know, not the very top, not the very bottom, but smaller seeds are generally planted closer to the top. Bigger seeds like peas or beans a little bit, uh, a little bit deeper. Planting, ideally transplant when it's cloudy or late in the afternoon or very early in the day, super early if you can. Never transplant on a hot midday or afternoon. Never transplant like during a heat wave, just kind of wait. Like, so for example, uh, had it not been forecast to be 88 degrees at my house tomorrow, we probably would have put our tomatoes into the ground. But because it is gonna be that hot and then we're looking in the forecast and later on next week, it's gonna cool off. We're gonna do some garden bed prep and then we're gonna wait to do that transplanting and just keep those plants in part shade, keep them happy, not transplant them or they might stress out right away. After you do your planting or your seeding, water plants and seeds in very well, especially for transplanting, that first watering is going to be the most important those plants will ever have. And while you're doing that, if you really wanna kind of go all out and, and give things the best boost, Considering consider mixing in a watering can up with some water, a little bit of liquid kelp and or fish emulsion to give those plants an extra, that's a typo, it should say boost, not boot, extra boost when watering them in. Uh, the liquid organic nutrients sometimes are just a little bit more instantly available. And so that's just, and you can also water the leaves as well as the soil and just gives things a little bit of extra boost. Like some people traditionally in some of the hardware stores, so like B vitamins, I generally like, I don't do that, but I will uh, do a little bit of liquid kelp and or fish. If you do the fish, fish is nice because it's high in nitrogen. The kelp has a lot of uh, micronutrients, some of which help stimulate uh, rooting and can help with trans transplant stress. Uh, the fish is super stinky. The kelp is stinky, but it smells like the ocean. And so those bottles, you can get, both of those normally at uh, a lot of the hardware stores, but also uh, independent nurseries, they come like a concentrate and normally it'll say like add, you know, some of them are like one ounce per gallon, they'll give you a dilution and you can do that. Uh, I've not done that plenty of times, but if I'm really trying to, you know, do everything, go all out, that is something that I will do. Uh, and after you do that first watering again, just check and make sure uh, that the soil hasn't settled down or moved right where you, like at the base of your transplanted vegetables, sometimes it'll expose some roots just because it becomes kind of like airy after you dig the hole and replace the soil. And you can kind of pat things back if you want to. See some questions coming in. I will get back to them as I finish just this planting part. So depending on the weather, if it is, again, like if it's gonna be that real heat wave and then die back, I will wait. And I always try to plant at the right time of year to where I'm not planting like in the hottest time of year, except for certain things where I might also do like a mid season planting. Uh, depending on the weather, if it's gonna be hot for a while and plants are young, it might be beneficial to shade the plants for a few days if you're transplanting to help avoid stress. This can be an upside down plant pot, uh, yogurt container with holes drilled in it, something so it would get some light, but some shade. I have a couple of old milk crates around my house. Sometimes I'll just use uh, some milk crates upside down. It seems to be about the right amount of uh, shade and uh, light that gets through. These in this picture are actually for a different reason. So in my yard, we do a lot of native gardening. We build a lot of bird habitat and we actually don't lose a lot of our crops to the birds. In fact, overall, like they'll eat a little bit, but overall it probably helps because they do eat a lot of our aphids and pest insects. But there's this critical phase when our carrots or our greens are very young, grown from seed and just coming up. And that's irresistible to our little birds. And so we have these flats that have just, we've accumulated from nurseries over the years. 
uh, that let enough light in, provide just a little bit of shade, which the young plants don't mind and the birds just can't get them. And then by the time the things are large enough that we're thinking about needing to remove these, then they're gonna be large enough that they're not gonna be as threatened by all of our birds. And they're easy to water right through them. Sometimes we'll take them off during the day, put them back on. And then here for some of these plants, we have these baking soda containers, uh, large yogurt containers work just fine too for this to cut off the bottom. Sometimes we will have, because we've built all this organic matter, this great soil, either raccoons or skunks will come and dig in our garden occasionally, uh, looking for grubs or worms, not for our plants, but sometimes they will damage the plants. Normally they do a pretty good job of staying in between. And then occasionally we also have uh, some issues with some roly polies, again, because of all of the, that organic matter that we've built, which overall grows our vegetables really well. And as soon as those vegetables start up and going, not an issue at all. And so this is our very kind of low tech, cheap, but very effective pest control is we just put these collars kind of around them. And then most of the roly polies just keep going, looking for other stuff. Uh, they mostly will eat decomposed organic matter. Uh, but if there's these fresh greens or young plants right there, it's just very tempting. Uh, and then eventually these come off. So just kind of some, some different tips or tricks that you can use. And you want to plan for irrigation. Sorry, uh, a roly poly, just saw that come in, is a sow bug. It's also called, or a pill bug. It's those little multi-segmented insects that kind of curl up into a ball if they get uh, surprised. And we're gonna have a whole section in the end, which might be more of a reference because we have a lot to cover on uh, pest insects. And I can see the, the time, it definitely will be just kind of a reference, but it kind of walks you through all the stuff. So plan for irrigation. You're gonna have to water your stuff. Plan to hose water or germinate to germinate seeds or get new transplants established. So even if you have a good drip irrigation system, immediately after transplanting or getting uh, new seeds to come up in a small home garden, not like a farm scale, I really recommend watering with the hose as often as needed. Might be once a day, might be every other day, might be twice a day if it's getting really hot. Uh, and then eventually you can switch over to your irrigation system. If you are hose watering established plants, like if you don't have a drip irrigation system or any permanent irrigation system, do your best to do the watering directly to the soil or if it's mulched on the mulch directly, keep the leaves of the plants as dry as possible to prevent disease. And so for us here in Southern California, I'm not gonna talk through all of this, but this is a general planting guide for our area in Southern California each kind of very active month of the gardening season. In Southern California, we're a little bit different. A lot of the plants that sometimes would be considered spring plantings, like especially uh, broccoli, cauliflower, a lot of the greens are fall plantings for us. And we grow them through the whole winter. Winter is really the easiest gardening time. And then in spring, we're doing our tomatoes, our peppers, our eggplants, our tomatillos, our beans, cucumbers. So refer back to this, uh, download that PDF and you'll get that. And then part of why I like those four inch wide beds, I mean, sorry, the four foot wide beds. And when we get to drip irrigation, we'll also have, it's gonna be four lines of drip irrigation, one foot apart, is that also makes a nice structure for measuring out uh, how many rows down the length of the bed to plant for different crops and how many rows or spacings across the bed to plant. Because for large uh, plants that, again, we're doing everything with the soil, the fertility, they're really going to get large are like carrots, I'm sorry, not carrots, like tomatoes, just one. But for beans, three rows across the bed. Uh, for cauliflower in the winter, if you are gonna do cauliflower, two across the bed. Uh, so here's kind of based on this assumption of that four foot wide bed and also how that irrigation would, would come in if you're gonna have an irrigation system, this all works together with that. This isn't following like any one other person's like square foot gardening or, or biointensive gardening, if you've heard some of that. This is just kind of what I've found works best for me with the way I garden in our local climate. The spacing is not as far apart as like agricultural farm spacing for 
some of the plants if you read those references, but it is significantly farther apart than square foot gardening or biointensive gardening, if you are familiar with those. In my experience with those kinds of approaches, if you're doing everything uh, to have large vigorous plants, then those spacings are too close. And if you let your plants just grow bigger, it's a lot less maintenance and you get a lot more harvest overall. So uh, to me, this is just kind of what uh, has worked for me. So question just came in for those of you who weren't here at the beginning, how do you get the PDF? Uh, it will be at cbwcd.org slash presentations. I'm going to upload the PDF right after this workshop and you can right click save as and you'll get all the slides. And so kind of all the main plants that you might consider growing at home. So quickly running you through uh, just transplanting. So I will literally measure out, and this is just an example in the ground, but it works the same way for raised bed. Literally use a tape measure, measure out your spacing. Uh, you can put a little stone, just make a divot in the soil here. We always have handy these little irrigation flags for projects. Your healthy transplant, about the right size, looking nicely, nice and vigorous. If you want to, optional, if you have that uh, kelp mix mixed up in a little thing, you can dip your uh, four inch pot into it, let it soak in some of those good nutrients, again, optional. Dig your hole as deep as and slightly wider than the root ball. With certain plants, specifically tomatoes and brassicas, so like kale, uh, broccoli, cauliflower, you can dig it a little bit deeper. They like being planted a little deep, but most things, and if you have any doubt, just match the top of the soil to the top of the root ball. Test it out, make sure that it's gonna look good. Everything's gonna be right before you transplant. Slowly tease the pot out. And this is about perfect. The roots have grown enough to hold that root ball together, but they're not really wrapping and spiraling super tight. You're just gonna hand loosen this a little bit. So just gently tease with your fingers, just so that when things grow, they'll be growing nice and out and won't continue to grow like along the edge of where the pot was. You can see here, gently pull the soil back, firm it up just a little bit. You don't need to really compact it, but firm it up so that when you water, the soil doesn't totally kind of collapse. Water it in and go from there. So not rocket science. And then you're going to be thinking time to get it established. So for your establishment period, whether it's seeds or transplants, the seeds and young seedlings need to stay consistently moist. Transplant needs consistent moisture at the beginning as well. Depending on the weather, it could be once a day, twice a day, or every few days. Use your finger, just kind of feel how's that soil doing. As plants grow in and establish though, they're gonna want deeper waterings and less often for their best health, growth, and fruit quality. Even in hot Southern California, you don't need to water every day. Many gardeners water too often and not deep enough for the optimal health and productivity of their plants. The exact timing depends on many factors, including weather and soil. Often though, in Southern California, for most of our summer crops in the hot time of year, this is gonna be a deep watering. What I often do for my sandy soils in Pomona, twice a week in the ground and two or three times a week in raised beds, just depending on sun exposure, soil or things like that. Most of the time for me, twice a week for my in the ground plants, three times a week for my raised beds. It's the same total amount of water. I just water a little bit deeper and a little less often when I water in the ground and a little bit more shallow and a little bit more often in the raised beds just because they tend to dry out a little bit quicker. So irrigation. I'm going to walk you through a way to dig up uh, I mean, sorry, a way to dig up, a way to install what I consider the kind of easiest, most accessible, but still high quality drip irrigation system for a raised bed. I can already tell we've had a great workshop, a lot of questions. It's gonna be a little bit rushed as I go through that, but I wanna do it. 
to go deeper into irrigation. And I really encourage you to do that because it, it's oftentimes the missing link for a lot of kind of backyard gardeners in hot areas. You can also check out our efficient watering for fruit trees and vegetable gardens online workshop, which is on our YouTube channel. But here's the basic. In the peak of summer in July, essentially you need to plan on replacing about a quarter of an inch of water per day over your vegetable garden area. And what I mean by a quarter of an inch is when we talk about irrigation demands, we do it in inches as if like when it rains, sometimes there's been an inch of rain. It's as if the whole area has been covered in an inch of water and then that all soaks in. And the reason why we talk about inches is because that way, whether you have 100 square feet of planting area, 25 square feet or 3000 square feet, it still scales. So basically in July in our area, and this will, you can figure this out for where you are, wherever you are, but in our area, inland Southern California, it's so about a quarter of an inch of water as if it had rained a quarter of an inch directly over your veggie area is what's needed in the summer to replace the, the water that's been lost, that plant water demand. Or for a typical four by eight foot raised bed planting area, that adds up to about five gallons a day for a four by eight raised bed area. That's important because if you have two beds, you know, that's 10 gallons, four beds, that's 20 gallons. But you're not gonna water your established plants every day. So for example, if you're watering twice per week, it's approximately every three and a half days, even though it might be like one day is three days, one day is four days. If you're watering twice per week, on average in July, it's about 17 and a half gallons of water to the root zone each time you water. So if you're manually watering, like with the hose, with your hose nozzle, with the, the hose open as much as you normally do, however you have it normally set up, you can figure out how long that's gonna take. Time how long it takes to fill up a five gallon bucket with however you normally have your hose and your nozzle, your attachment set up. And then you're gonna have to spend three and a half times that much to get from those five gallons to that you know, 17 and a half. Three and a half times that much time watering each four by eight area. So you can see that if you're doing it twice a week, you have a few beds, 17 and a half gallons each time you do it to really get that good deep soaking to replace in the middle of summer. It's gonna add up to a long time, especially because you might not be able to do that all at once. You might have to water one bed, water another bed kind of halfway, uh, go back to the first one, maybe do something else, let that water soak in. So that's why it rapidly gets us to why drip irrigation is such an appealing way to water most vegetable gardens, if you, that's an option. And that's not to say you have to do that. So oftentimes, and including the garden where I live now, uh, when we first moved in and got our vegetable garden started, I had did not have time that first season to get my full awesome irrigation system in. So we did hand water that first season. And then going into the second season, we knew like before summer, I really got to get that irrigation system in. It'll save a ton of time. We're motivated and now, uh, irrigation, we still need to be aware, feel the soil, look at the plants, uh, make sure that we're watering the right amount, even though I'll give you some guidelines for how to figure out how to do that. Uh, but in terms of the time of actual watering, very minimal, except that hose watering to establish. And then harvesting. Harvesting is a surprising amount of the work of vegetable gardening. And that's, this is often where beginning gardeners get overwhelmed and a good part of why I encourage people to start small. If you are following everything that we're talking about, building the bed right or gardening, uh, knowing if you can garden in the ground or your raised bed, the soil fertility, the mixing in the compost, the irrigation, you might get a really good harvest, which is great, but that harvest can be time consuming and you wanna make sure you stay on top of it. You wanna harvest often once your plants are fully ripe or your crop is fully ripe or ready to be harvested to ensure that those plants remain productive. The more you harvest as appropriate, uh, the longer the plant will stay productive, the more it will produce because it's kind of about developing seeds. If you stop harvesting those seeds all in the fruit, all fully ripen, the plant might prematurely think it's done for the season because it's, it's done its job. So harvest often, when things are fully ripe, will give you the best quality product, keep your plants productive. 
And for most plants, morning is the best time to harvest. Avoid harvesting in the middle of a hot day because a lot of the crops, especially for greens and roots, uh, can kind of dehydrate quickly. Uh, if you do have to harvest midday, soak it in some cold water right away to kind of get that heat off of the harvest. Uh, for tomatoes, doesn't matter quite as much, but for definitely for roots and, uh, and leafy crops, it's super important. And if you want to learn more, here's some top sources. Top two are seed companies, but they have great information online. Peaceful Valley Farm Supply also sells other stuff, but Peaceful Valley Farm Supply, Johnny's Seeds, and then for those of you on the West Coast, but even pretty much anywhere else, University of California has something called Garden Web with great information. Wherever you are, you're, you might have a local university with a cooperative extension. Sometimes there's really great kind of place-based, you know, where you are, how to garden kind of stuff. Uh, so now we'll answer some questions and then we will spend a good chunk of the rest of this workshop talking about irrigation. And then I'll end in terms of showing you some guides for kind of plant by plant information, uh, plant tips and uh, kind of uh, pest control information, kind of using kind of an organic and ecological framework. So from anonymous attendee, what kind of mulch do you recommend using? So in hot, dry areas, mulching the garden bed in the summer after the plants have been established usually can help quite a bit. I just use the same wood chip mulch that I would use in the rest of my garden. And what I use is just the stuff that we give away for free at the Waterwise Community Center. Any kind of ground wood chip mulch, ground arborist trimmings work. Uh, and in an urban area, that's often the, the easiest mulch we have available. Sometimes in rural areas, if you have kind of spent straw, as long as you know that there's not herbicides that are, are accumulated on that straw or just kind of anything organic to cover the soil can work. Uh, because that mulch locks in moisture, which is a good thing. It can attract some pill bugs or roly polies or earwigs, which on very young plants can uh, can kind of chew them up some. I normally wait till things are uh, kind of established and then I will, which it happens before it gets really hot in the middle of summer anyways, and then we will mulch. And then normally that mulch all pulls off uh, before our winter planting. And normally what we do, since it's the same wood chip mulch we use in the pathways, when it's time to pull the mulch back, we just rake it or uh, you know, rake it up and just toss it onto the pathway to then refresh the mulch on the pathway. Uh, how do you keep nut grass out of the garden? Uh, pull it out as soon as you can pull it out or like I mentioned before, cardboard, cardboard mulching and pathways. But if it's in your veggie beds, you just need to keep digging it out. Eventually you'll, you'll win. Dig it out as soon as it can. Oh, thanks, Jan. Uh, Jan just chatted in that there's a typo on my UC link. So I am going to re-put Jan's comment into the chat for everybody. Uh, Sean as well. Thank you very much. Okay. Would I recommend watering the hole before transplanting? Uh, not a bad idea if you want to. Normally I don't because I make sure that my garden soil is nice and kind of evenly moist across the whole thing. Like I'll irrigate all the soil uh, before transplanting. You never want to transplant into bone dry soil. Water everything really well and then let it dry out a couple of days if you need to, if you haven't been gardening in that area for a long time. But yeah, some people like to water the whole let it drain out right before transplanting. And if uh, if that sounds good to you, uh, definitely, definitely uh, go for it. It's not a bad thing. Uh, Andrew, is the parking lot at our headquarters, uh, CBWCD at Montclair still open for picking up mulch in the parking lot every day? Yes, it is. Uh, Okay, a lot of questions coming in. Some of these are more personal, uh, like Karen about your cilantro seedling. I'll, I'll have to hold those till the end because it's looking like we have so many questions. I could just keep answering questions and we won't have any time to talk about irrigation, which is what most of the 77 people here will probably uh, need. So I think at this point in time, it's great that we have so many questions but I'm going to need to hold them until the end. So hopefully that works out okay with everybody because trust me, you wanna get through this content. 
So we're going to look at a simple but very effective irrigation system for a few raised beds or in the ground beds. Uh, if you have a more ambitious garden or really doing a large area, kind of trying to do a small urban farm, this is not the necessarily best approach. There's a very similar approach, but uses a more agricultural drip product called T-tape. And I covered that step-by-step -step with a lot of examples in the efficient watering for fruit trees and vegetable gardens class. This is built very similar, but I wanted to provide, since most of the people who come to this workshop are wanting to do one or two raised beds, doing a special order for kind of agriculture specialty irrigation products isn't always what you're looking to do. So I wanted to provide the still economical, but basically highest quality drip irrigation system with stuff that you can usually buy locally. So this is a drip product available from Home Depot uh, and then some other products available from the specialty irrigation supply stores. And I'll explain kind of all the whys as we go. This is the, the system that we use at the WaterWise Community Center's demonstration garden. So I'm, I'm confident in it uh, and yeah, it works well and pretty easy to put in and is very efficient. So critical thing, if you're working with drip irrigation, whether you're connecting to an automatic valve, which is ideal, or a hose, which is just fine as well, all drip systems must have a filter and a pressure reducer after the connection to the valve or the hose. Not optional. It's one of the huge things that I see people not do is put in the drip and not do the pressure reducer and the filter. Doesn't work that way. Things fall apart. Things get clogged. Not engineered to work without it. So... I'm not going to have time to get into like how to set up automatic valves. Just know everything that we're talking about. You can have the pressure reducer and the filter, then go to a pipe, which feeds the irrigation system we're talking about. Or in the example I'll show, it's super low tech if you're just connecting it to a hose. Depending on what drip product you're using, might have a different, uh, different requirements for the pressure reduction. So I'll show you what we need here. So here's just some general parts. And I'm going to go through the parts very quickly both because of the time we have left, but also because we're then gonna show kind of assembling all those parts. But assuming that you're gonna connect it to a hose, the thread on a hose connection is different than the thread on a pipe connection. And so you can't screw them into each other. You'll strip the parts, it won't make a watertight seal. That's just how it was built out. In an ideal world, they'd be the same, but they didn't ask me before they started manufacturing irrigation equipment. Uh, so on one side, the thread is a little tighter for the pipe thread. And so you need an adapter if you're going to connect the hose to it. You'll know which side go, the hose goes on because that side will have a washer. Uh, the, what I highly recommend for this piece, because you're going to be screwing the hose in and out quite a bit, is you get a brass one, which is available at any local landscape supply store or irrigation supply store. You're not going to find it at the big box hardware store. And most urban and suburban areas have these around. Uh, in Southern California, there's a number of chains. Some of them are national. Ewing, uh, Smith Pipe and Supply, and uh, Site One are other are some common ones. Also around us, there is Modern Irrigation. Uh, all of those will have that sort of stuff. Thread seal tape to make water tight connections anywhere where you're screwing things together. Our filter. This is the filter pressure reducer as well in one piece, which is nice. Normally for wherever you're getting your actual drip product, your drip line with the drippers in it, they will also have like the same brand and same specifications for the pressure reducer that will work for it. So for example, at the landscape supply store, they're going to sell these pressure reducers and filters for like typical landscape irrigation drip line, which works at a higher pressure than this uh, drip line that I'm going to show. So you need to get the part because this is at 25 pounds per square inch pressure is what it regulates to the larger uh, or the, the larger and more landscape drip line uh, is normally at 30 to 40 PSI. And so that will be too high for this. So this from Home Depot, just where you get the line. And this is just what it looks like on the inside. Uh, the color and exact shape might be a little bit different, but it's just a filter. So it makes sure that even though if you're connected to city water, it's pretty clean water, even if there's just a little bit of grit or whatever, because the drip irrigation parts are so small, then it just catches it in this filter. You just need to flush it out every six months or so. 
And then you'll need some adapters to go to different parts, including over to your drip part. And so this is the adapter that will get from all your screwed parts over to a drip irrigation line, which is a barb, a drip line, which is this, just kind of pushes over that and it makes a, a watertight seal. You're going to have some distribution tubing. This is about a half inch solid, so no emitters, pipe that then you can cut, which will be at one side of your bed, and that will feed the water into all of your drip lines. So there's different fittings that let you have elbows. There's a valve you can slide in to turn water on and off. You will see at the big box hardware store, instead of the fittings that are these little barbs that you slide the, the pipe onto, you will see these, which are called compression fittings. They are easier to put on than these barb fittings but they break and leak over time and the barb fittings rarely do. So I encourage you, even if it takes a little bit more elbow grease, stick with these rather than these. These tend to have a lot of problems over time. And this is the actual stuff that you'll use. Comes in a hundred foot roll for this system. Critical, critical, six inch spacing between the actual drip emitters. So the drip emitters, you can see these holes and there's actually like a plastic bodied engineered emitter. So it's not just a hole in the tube along on the inside for all of these. For vegetables, the six inch spacing is critical. There is an almost identical product which has 12 inch spacing, an almost identical product which has 18 inch spacing, too far apart for getting our young vegetables established. So everything that I'm going to talk about from here on out assumes that you have this six inch. And Normally, I don't recommend any one source, especially not a big box hardware store, but Home Depot happens to be the only place that sells this. The other sources for the other stuff that I like are like special order online sort of stuff. The local irrigation supply stores around here in Southern California are only selling stuff for landscape and the closest emitter spacing they have in their drip line is 12 inch, too far for what I like for vegetables. So that's why I'm recommending this product is because it's the only thing I know of that you can buy locally that has that six inch spacing. Uh, if you are in a different area, maybe you have different options. And again, if you want that kind of more like for a little bit larger scale, you're gonna do some special ordering uh, product. You can check that other uh, efficient watering for fruit trees and vegetable gardens workshop, but this stuff works great. And so at the proper pressure reduction, each one of these emitters puts out approximately half a gallon per hour. You'll see GPH, gallons per hour. And then there's other little fittings, which are these little barb fittings that are really easy to work with that then kind of do your connections. Just one quick note, for some reason, the Home Depot near us, if you check the availability online, it always says they can only special order it. But whenever I go into the store, they have it on the shelf. So I don't know, but just something to be aware of. And so these, you'll have some elbows, you'll have some T's where they come together in different directions. And you'll also have these little valves that we'll use as our flush valve. So to quickly go through it, we're going to start, I normally start with just the pressure reducer and filter itself. On one side, wrap that thread steel tape on. And there's a correct way to do this. I don't really have time to cover it, but you can check out on, on YouTube or our basic irrigation classes and we go through it. It's simple, but you want to make sure you wrap it the right way. And on, on this side, I will attach the hose adapter because then we're gonna be feeding this with a hose. Then on the other side, I'll attach what's called the coupler, which just has the female thread on both sides, gives us that. And then I will wrap this adapter that goes from the three quarter inch thread to the barb fitting for our half inch drip line. And that gives us that. And basically, so our host screws into here, and then this starts feeding at the right pressure, clean water. It's a good idea to get a plug that you can screw into this side, which you can get something that'll fit at that same uh, irrigation specialty store. So that way you're not getting dirt and stuff in here when it's kind of out in the garden, when it's not connected to the hose. And then you start cutting your pieces of drip line. 
So your larger drip line, whenever you're working with drip line, quick tip, leave it in the sun for a little while, it'll warm it up, make it more flexible. When you're cutting it, you can use either a cutter specifically for plastic pipe, or if you have just a very sharp garden uh, pruners, you can use that as well, works just fine. And then for the fittings, as well as just for putting the stuff together, Normally for those barbed fittings, those brown ones, there's a lot of companies that make good ones, but for homeowners, I do tend to recommend the Rainbird company, their fittings, which are available at uh, most specialty landscape supply stores because they have this little tool, which only costs a few bucks, which are meant there's an extra little ridge that those snap into, gives you more leverage. And you can also use this part of the tool to kind of just barely loosen up the drip tube, makes it a little bit easier to push things together. And so you'll push on a small piece to get started. And you can see you just kind of wrestle it on a little bit till it seats all the way. And then loosen the next one. And we'll start with a 90 degree angle fitting. Which you push on. And so you can see how we're setting it up. So the hose will come in here and now the tube will go up the outside of the bed. If you really want to, some people really like to put them up the inside of the bed. Guess it looks a little cleaner, but then you need to do all of that before you fill it. I just like to do everything to the outside and use a couple of clamps that'll screw into the side of the bed, just so everything is always accessible if I ever wanna make some changes. It's very easy, I don't mind seeing it. And then you can kind of just start pulling it out. You don't even need to necessarily measure it. You can kind of just pull it up, put a thumbnail on where you wanna cut, make your cut, another 90 degree. And then we're gonna send what's called our header, which is going to be the piece of pipe that will go across here and then feed our actual drip emitter line. So for this one, I will measure it out. You wanna leave a little extra space here because we're gonna put a little flush valve there. So you don't want necessarily pipe all the way, but if you put out too much, you can always just cut it down a little bit. So measuring that out, cut it, put my piece on. And then down at the other end, I'm gonna put this little valve. So instead of just stopping it up with like an end piece, I like to put a valve. So that way when I both turn it on for the first time, as well as once every six months or so, I can just flush out any little grit that it might have gotten into the system. So it doesn't one day block the drip emitters. So that's basically what you're gonna have on the end. And then I'm gonna measure for where my actual drip lines are gonna run. So because it's a four foot wide bed, I really am a fan of drip lines one foot apart from each other. So four foot wide bed, four drip lines. You start one six inches in, then another foot, then another foot, then another foot, which is gonna be six inches from the other side. And that gives a very nice and even watering, which is why I like to stick for, to a four foot bed. If you end up a little bit wider, things are a little bit farther apart. Maybe it's not quite as even. It's not going to be so bad. It's not going to be the end of the world, but I don't know. I, I tend to be obsessive about setting things up accurately. And then all just the other chaos of the world comes in from there. And so something that you will need for your system are these things. If you've worked with drip irrigation systems before, you know what they are. They're called drip staples. And they're basically these little metal half hoops that hold down the pipe because as the temperature changes throughout the day, the plastic expands and contracts a little bit and it'll wiggle around some if it's not uh, stapled down. They're open on the bottom. You get them in like a pack of a hundred or at the hardware store, you can get them in smaller packs. And I'll also use those as markers as I go. So I'll mark my six inches, foot over 18 inches, all my other spacings. And that way, when it comes to doing work with the pipe, I just have a quick visual reference. And then you'll need to punch a hole in your header line this is the type of hole punch that I like the best. Uh, you just kind of squeeze the trigger and it pops a hole in it. There are cheaper ones that are more just like a punch that you put in. Either one works fine. Uh, I do a lot of drip irrigation, so I have this. And this one's still like six or seven bucks. Just make sure that you're actually punching the right side of the drip line, that it's facing in the direction you want the line to go. Do that. Basically, that's the hole that's going to be left. And then you work with your fittings, so your barbed connector and you just push that in and there you go. I, 
always have a pack of what are called goof plugs. If you put a hole on the wrong side or in the wrong place, these are just a solid little fitting that plugs up that hole. If you don't have that and you put one in the wrong place, then you have a big leak and you'll have to go back to the hardware store to get that. So it only costs a couple of bucks to get that. Just have it with you. And so you put those in at all of the locations where we're going to have our correct measurement. And then you go down to the other side and you do the same marks for where those lines are going to end. So you can see one, two, three, four. And then you install and pull your line. Quick tip, whether you're working with this or the larger drip line, any piping product that comes in a roll that's kind of bound up with tape or a strap, it's meant that you cut the inside, leave the outside on, and then you can uncoil just from the inside, helps keep the rest of the coil manageable and prevent it from tangling. You always want to start with a nice clean cut. So that's, you know, a little bit ragged. And for this small stuff, I just use a sharp garden pruners. You can use that pipe cutter too, if you want, whatever you have. And then I want my first strip line to be pretty close to the edge. So you'll cut it so that your first strip line is going to be pretty close there. And you just push it on. And from there, you pull it out, pull it to the end, make a cut. And then I'll often hang that over the edge just so that I won't get soil in it. When you're setting up your second line, here is a trick to give you the most even watering. Ideally, to get the most even watering, you want to do what's called triangulating or staggering your drip emitters in between the lines. And so here's what I mean. Here's where the first two emitters are on this run. You can just make a little line in the soil to go over to where the second line is going to be. You want your next line to have its first emitter or right here. So it's kind of making a triangle in the middle. That will give you the most even distribution. You won't get it perfectly, but if you attempt to do that in between each line, you're going to get slightly better water distribution throughout the soil more even as you go. And so you want to kind of line that up so you can see here is my dot and with how the line cut doesn't quite reach there. So I'll actually pull it over to the next one and cut a little bit more off so I can get my emitter roughly in that in between position. And then you pull the rest of the lines and keep doing that until you get to something like this. And then down at the other end, you need to bring it all together now. So use some of those staples to temporarily hold it in place. And then you cut another piece of this drip line. You'll end up with a couple of extra emitters along this edge, no big deal. And then you'll use two of these little 90 degree elbow pieces for the corners. So I start with the first corner and then you'll use a T when you get to the next one. So you can have the line across the end and then the line feeding. And then another T and then the end. And you can see here how the line wiggles some, which is why you need the staples all the way down to keep, really keep it in place. And then the last thing you'll want to do is you'll do another cut somewhere towards the middle, another T, another blank little piece of line. And then one of these little valves, which will also be a flush valve. And so you'll start with that open and this open. So the valve opens so water can go through. That's the line is going to be along the line. So there's always a line at the top, an indicator on one of these little valves. If it's across, it's off. You always want to have it in the on position the first time you turn on your irrigation system. So you'll connect the hose, turn it on, let water run through here for a minute, and then close it down. So it flushes out any little bit of debris. And then that'll shoot all the rest of the water out through here because that's open. Then shut that down. And there you go. Super high efficiency drip irrigation system. Now, it's pretty much 12 o'clock now. So what I'm going to do is I am going to just walk you through, for those of you who are going to download the presentation, the rest of the information that I have here for you. And I think what I'm going to do is because this is a 
half of what you need to know for the irrigation system. The other part of what you need to know is really how often and how long to run this irrigation system. And that's going to be based on your weather and where you are. I mean, the one thing you can do is always poke in the soil, dig down a little bit, check, and when it's getting dry, not just slightly dry, but you know, kind of dry, uh, run it again. But for those of you who want to go kind of the next step, know what to anticipate, probably for different times of the year, how many times a week to water and how long, especially if you're in our local area in Southern California, I've developed a lot of resources to help you know that based on what to anticipate different times of the year, how many, how much uh, in inches the area is going to need, this system, how to quantify how many inches per hour it puts out running, how to make sense of it to figure out your run times, uh, and then how to figure that out in terms of like one day a week, two days a week for what you actually run. And then I also kind of have created some information in terms of, okay, but what if you're gonna be doing this with a hose? How do you know what that means? And so what I think I'm gonna do is sometime next week, I'll create a little supplemental YouTube video that walks you through this. It's really more uh, in depth than we really have time to explain in this workshop where we're covering so much else. So you can probably by next weekend, hopefully that'll be up on YouTube. And so, you know, for now, you're not gonna use that probably next week cause you'd be getting this going. And then you can really apply all that kind of nitty gritty details with that supplemental video. I'll also put the link to that supplemental video in the, in the main recording. And then other references for you to have here, which I never get through when I teach this, but I want to provide you with are kind of step-by-step. Step, so there'd be no reason for me to read this all out to you anyways, but step-by-step, step, if you wanna download the slides for some of our most popular homegrown vegetables, kind of tomatoes, my top tips in terms of what to do and common problems in terms of what to do about them. So, you know, it will go step by step, tomatoes, peppers, okra, melons, eggplant. Uh, and then we also have for what are in Southern California are cool season or fall planted vegetables. Top tips for each of those. And then finally, for dealing with pests, integrated pest management, thinking about it from kind of a holistic perspective, some top tips in terms of how to even approach it. And then for dealing with the different really things that often show up, some of these I have either organic or what I consider very low impact pesticides. So for example, for ants, taro, it's just borax basically with some sweetener, safe for dogs, safe for kids. So I feel okay, even though I'm mostly organic garden doing that. Some of the other ones like sluggo, I've done research into all of these personally feel very comfortable, even though I mostly do habitat gardening and organic gardening. Some of these are organic products. If you need to go that far, sometimes you don't. I included a little bit of identification for some of the main pests, as well as some of the beneficials that you don't want to confuse for pests. And then at the very end, although it's in here earlier, that general plant and garden spacing for our area. So if you want to download those slides, you'll get access to all that stuff that I've, I've kind of consolidated from just kind of my experiences over the years of, of what has worked for me in my Southern California garden. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. What I'm going to do is I'm going to launch into the question and answers. I have plenty of time to stay and answer questions. However, for those of you who are still here and might need to leave before you leave and before I launch into the Q&A, if you could please quickly fill out our closing poll, I would really appreciate it. Helps me as well as our organization out a lot. Uh, just four questions. In addition to what's in here, I really, really uh, value comments that come in from the chat. This is only the second time I've taught this online. Normally when I teach this and it's not in a pandemic situation, we're kind of like doing all of this out in the garden, which seems to be a much more natural way to teach this. So 
I would really appreciate uh, if anyone has comments in the chat, either what worked well for you, if there's anything specific that you found valuable, or if there are things that weren't clear, uh, you wish that we had more time for, or even like we should develop a whole other workshop for because you, you want you know more information about it. Uh, also, let me know. I, I always read all of these and, uh, and we really use the comments to guide what we do in the future or to make sure we're doing our job uh, as well as we can. And so with that, while those of you are filling this out, I will start answering all of the questions that have come in. I'll go to the older questions and go from there. And I know we have a few people who have left already. Uh, so I'm gonna check and make sure people are still here. Okay, so from Susanna, uh, could you use Mel's mix in the raisin bed? I don't know what Mel's mix is. Is that the is that the square foot gardening mix? If so, I can let you know my thoughts. But if you can type back into the Q and A uh, or the chat what Mel's mix is, then I can try to answer you better. Uh, okay. So how to download the PDF. Okay, from Allison, are you still here? Allison, can I talk about which plants are good for container gardening? Totally, we can cover that some now. Uh, that's actually what I wrote my master's thesis on and did a experiment on it, was trying to figure out if growing fruit in containers is worth it for urban kind of gardens and did a lot of crop tests. And here's what I came up with. If you have a big enough pot, you can grow at least the small varieties or the dwarf varieties of most vegetables. So like you can grow tomatoes, but grow like the smaller bush tomatoes. Uh, I mean, you can grow eggplant, you can grow, especially there's some like zucchini seeds now where they're meant for kind of containers and all that stuff works. But the issue with a lot of those plants is that they have such big root systems that by the time you get through one system, or by the time you get through one season, those roots from like a tomato plant or a zucchini plant have totally like densely kind of clogged up all of that potting soil in the container. Like, so it's beyond where I say, leave this, leave the, the, roots in, let them rot down. It's, it's kind of dense and thick and you won't be able to very effectively usually plant again. So you're having to replace all that potting soil the next season too. And because it's growing in a container, usually those plants of those vegetables that want to become large have, don't have huge production. And so that's not to discourage you from planting in containers, but that's just the reality. If you want to do those, you need to be motivated, plan on having to replace the potting soil. What works great in containers are all the culinary herbs, uh, thyme, oregano, rosemary. If you use lavender, uh, even seasonally, uh, basil or cilantro, all of that works super well. That works so well that I have some large kind of 18 inch containers uh, 20 inch containers, just plastic ones that came from the hardware store, where even though I have a huge organic garden in the yard, we still have our herbs in some of those big pots. We've transplanted, transported them uh, just on the U-Haul truck from the last place we lived. And we still keep using those because we can put those right outside our kitchen back door where it's a patio space and harvest them without having to go out into the garden uh, in the dark. So those work super well. The other thing that works really well are salad greens anything that you can cut and come again. So salads, small chards, kales, anything like that. Uh, those work really well and greens don't have super deep roots that are going to really clog up like all of that, that uh, potting soil. So when I grow greens in containers, you can kind of harvest, when you do your final harvest, just clear out like the top little bit of the root system and then just top off each season with another inch or two of potting soil and you can really keep that going. So greens is kind of really where I find that it's at. And with those greens, you can kind of keep cutting and coming back and recutting over a long season. The other thing that works really well in containers are carrots. If you have a deep enough container, carrots 
love that loose uh, potting soil, but you only really get one harvest after uh, a long season. So we also kind of need to think about that. And then you can kind of guide that on what's going to be worth it to you. But that's, that's kind of my, my general take on container gardening. Uh, so if I'm interested in kind of eating everything, what I would grow in containers mostly would be herbs and grains, because that's like a super efficient system. Uh, and I would really only grow other stuff if I really wanted the experience of growing it. If you really want the experience of growing it, then feel free to try other stuff. The other thing is, uh, if you're in a hot area like Southern California, plastic containers work better than terracotta containers because they hold the moisture in better. And if you're really trying to do like production and you're less concerned about like the aesthetics of what it looks like, uh, what I am really a fan of doing and what I did for my thesis project to have a large area. And I was really trying to figure out, can it be economical as well to grow vegetables in containers, even with all the costs is I took 18 gallon storage tubs like the, the highest quality plastic you can find, uh, not the clear ones, but like some sort of opaque plastic, like mine were just tan colored storage tubs, usually not the cheapest ones because you want what seems like a good quality plastic, drill a number of half inch drainage holes in the bottom and just grow in those. And those also have a rectangular layout, which is kind of nice for a seeding plan. It's easier than, uh, than round ones. So for Mary Ann, from Marianne, uh, my neighbor who has a successful garden discouraged my husband from using mulch because he stated it can attract spiders and bugs. We actually use the mulch giveaway from Chino Water, Chino Basin Water Conservation District. Cool, that's the mulch I use in my garden as well. Uh, here's the thing, people tend to be afraid of insects. So spiders, I've never seen a black widow living in garden mulch. Uh, other than that, spiders are good to have in the garden. They're predators and they eat a lot of the pest insects. So I don't mind spiders. I also don't think that mulch in the garden attracts spiders. I don't really see that. I spend a lot of time in many gardens. Uh, insects, over time, like I mentioned, it can, because it keeps things extra moist, which is great for your roots and great for the soil, it can attract uh, roly polies or sow bugs and earwigs, which are not an issue on established vegetables. When things are very little, they can be. So I wait until my veggies are a little established which is normally happening in the spring before it's really hot and I feel like I really need that mulch. And then again, I remove that mulch before I replant and just use it in my pathway areas. Uh, but if you see that there are too many, then you can kind of pull back on the mulch. Uh, but there's just so much benefit of keeping the soil cool and saving water that, that I generally tend to mulch instead of not. Especially kind of mid-season in the summer is when it's really important. Can I repeat the info about how to pick up the mulch from the WaterWise Community Center? Uh, absolutely. So basically, in our parking lot, which is on San Bernardino Street in Montclair, just south of the 10 Freeway, we have a big pile of mulch that we keep uh, generally it's there every day. You can always call our main number, which you can get from our website. I'll put it in a uh, couple of couple of websites into the chat. Our main website is cbwcd.org org or you can get the main contact information and our administrative assistant who answers the phone i mean she sees the mulch pile every day when she's parking she can tell you just to confirm we pretty much always have it there though because we have a relationship with the producer and they bring it to us for free so we just call them when we're running low uh, if you want to see a little map of exactly where things are set up and how to get it even though if you just come to our main address into the parking lot you will see it you can go to cbwcd.org mulch when we do get compost for our compost giveaway, it goes right next to it. However, it's normally gone in like two days. So you can call to ask if we have compost as well, or we also uh, normally will publish that on our social media when it does show up. And basically you just pull into the parking lot and it's an area where you can pull over next to it and other cars can still get by and you bring all your own containers or fill your own truck, take as much as you want, bring your own tools. It's totally unattended. We just ask that everybody stays socially distanced and wears the mask while they're doing it. Uh, okay. So from LGR, are you still with us? Uh, LGR, I'm going to be starting carrots by seed and cardboard type pods. How many seeds do I put in each pod? I'm going to throw you a curveball. Don't do that. Uh, 
Carrots don't like being transplanted. Their roots are pretty sensitive. Start the carrots where you're going to be growing them in small rows in the garden. Along, if you're doing it along a drip line, uh, along the line with about one inch in between each seed planted roughly between a quarter and an eighth of an inch deep. So pretty shallow, just enough to get some soil over it because that's where they're gonna wanna grow. It's less work and you'll have a more successful crop and you don't need to buy extra cardboard type pods. Uh, so just do it right in place. That's how carrots have long been grown. That's how I always grow carrots. Just keep that soil moist, which is no more difficult. In fact, sometimes easier than keeping the soil in those pods moist. Or if you're doing it in container, do it right in the container. Uh, and then after they start to grow, you're gonna grow, you're gonna plant them about one inch apart. And then you, uh, and then you will thin them as they start growing. And you can thin them when they're baby carrots too, about three inches apart. And then those will grow into nice full grown carrots. And all those kind of spacings and things like that are in the, some of those guide pages that I have. Uh, so Roberta redoing her garden on cement because of years of attempting to keep nutgrass out. Yeah, so I had a big vegetable garden on a concrete driveway. Uh, just, I would go with close to two feet tall raised beds because the bottom is gonna be not very well draining. Uh, so from Karen, received a cilantro seedling from a friend that developed a flower about two weeks after I planted it. Is it done being productive for now? It pinched off the flower, but it's not growing much. Should I just pull it out? Uh, so we are at the very end of cilantro growing season right here in Southern California. Right when it starts flowering, normally it doesn't grow that much more. Uh, you can eat it. You can see if it grows a little bit more uh, because you did pinch it off, that was the right thing to do. But it's once we first get start getting our first uh, real heat, that really encourages cilantro if you're inland, if you're not on the coast, like our kind of heat to go to seed. The cilantro in my bed is starting to flower as well. And we are starting to like harvest it this week as much as we can because with the 88 degree weather planned for tomorrow, planned, forecasted for tomorrow, uh, that's probably gonna really try to get it to go to seed. Uh, and that is true, Cremilda uh, typed in, cilantro doesn't really like being transplanted either. Uh, yeah, I always start cilantro uh, from seed. It does take a while to get going, but totally worth it. Uh, okay, how do you feel about using PVC pipes for drip irrigation? So you can use PVC if you want to feed drip irrigation or to get from your valve to drip irrigation. Some people will try to drill holes in PVC pipe and consider that drip irrigation to kind of, instead of just with a hose, there's holes along the pipe and when water goes through it, it kind of goes out into each uh, area. That because, so like in drip irrigation products, where I always encourage people to use the ones where the drippers are in the line, like the one I showed, or you know, larger ones, there's different styles, but those actually aren't just holes, they're engineered emitters, where when it pressurizes, the water has to go through this engineered path, which evens out to have the exact same amount of water come out at the exact same rate from each of those emitters. If you have holes in a PVC pipe, you're gonna get a lot more water coming out closer to the water source than farther, and it's gonna come out much quicker and there'll be a lot more kind of pooling and water kind of doing its own thing. So I don't recommend it. Now that being said, some people do it and I, I would never say like, oh, that's not gonna work because some people might say, yeah, well, it's been working for me. Uh, but it's not the system that I recommend, especially in the system that I teach. I try to teach systems where I reduce as many variables as I can. So it's gonna work for the greatest number of people and it can provide the most guidance. And so that's why it wouldn't be my go-to system. Uh, so from Mary Ann, any recommendations from individuals who will come in and fix up an old irrigation system? Uh, so I can't make recommendations for specific contractors because I work for government agency, for presenting this for a government agency, but I do have a couple of questions. First one is where do you live? Because if, and what kind of system is it? Is it like a 
vegetable gardening kind of drip system or is it more of a landscape system? Are you having issues with valves or things like that? If you are having issues with like valves or sprinklers or kind of those more infrastructure issues and you happen to live on the western edge of San Bernardino County, let me know because there might be a local. Oh, so you're, you're in Ontario and it was for the grass. There might be a system from Ontario utilities that can help you out actually, a program that can help you out for free. Uh, get in touch with, uh, her name is Amy at Ontario and she is in charge of water conservation for Ontario municipal utilities. Uh, if you want to, I'm sure you can uh, just call in, talk with customer service and get in touch with her. Let customer service and her know that you're interested in the irrigation tune-up program, which is a really cool program that the local utilities have for uh, someone to come and do some basic fixes. So they're limited on how much they can do, but they can do some stuff with valves, uh, fixing some sprinklers, things like that. Uh, they can't put in a whole new irrigation system or anything like that, but call them, see what they can do. Hopefully they can help you out. Okay, from Sarah B, did I say Rainbird or Rain Drip insertion tool? So th that one with the insertion tool and those specific fittings, that's Rainbird. No, Rain Drip is another company, but yeah, that one happens to be Rainbird. Uh, from LF, to ease fittings uh, for pushing that drip in, uh, putting the end in really hot water for several seconds is a recommendation. That is true. However, I will say I know people who have tried to do that and they have ended up like they'll put really hot water into a like mug or a thermos and try to do that. And they have ended up just pouring hot water all over themselves. So I don't normally make a broad recommendation for that, but that is true. Hot water can loosen up those ends of the pipe for fittings. Or if you're in a backyard and you can get an extension cord, a uh, hairdryer could work as well. From Susan, for the drip, how many staples per foot? Uh, less than one per foot. Normally it's like every three to four feet in the garden with the little tube, like we saw that little quarter inch tube about every, I was gonna say about every three feet, but that's that would be really like only three per bed, three to three to four along an eight foot bed. So every two to three feet for the little stuff. How can you set up timers to do this too? Great question, Susan. Uh, so if this whole system is run by a valve, like you can have just the same valves that would run your, any other part of your irrigation system at home, you can have set up to feed a system like this that pressure reducer and the filter goes right after the valve, then the pipe goes down into the ground, then it can feed the system. That's like how, that's how we have it set up at the Waterwise Community Center after we did show the example with the hose. Uh, for the first year that I had this system at my house, because I hadn't gotten around to the valves yet, I did it with a hose, now it's on a valve. So once you have that on the valve, your normal timer that you have that would run your landscape irrigation system can also be set up to run this as well. Uh, and then you're just gonna have to be changing the, your timer more often than you would probably for your landscape irrigation system to be telling it what to do. That's where some of the newer timers that can actually log on to your home Wi-Fi system, if your Wi-Fi system reaches that area, really allow you to do all of that like on your phone or on your computer. And th that's the system that I use at home. So I'm constantly making little changes uh, or tweaks to my vegetable system uh, throughout the year, how many days a week, how long, based on that information that I'll record in the supplemental video. But it's super easy to do, uh, make those changes into my irrigation timer because I can do that on my phone. Also, a lot of those more modern ones allow you more program options. So if you want a separate program just for your vegetables, even though you might also have like one for your fruit trees, one for a lawn area, one for a water-wise garden area, uh, there's more different options and flexibility on a lot of those uh, newer Wi-Fi enabled timers. The other thing you can do, which I have in another part of my landscape where it's not connected to the timer is you can also, if you're going more low tech and still connected to a hose, I do recommend considering a hose bib timer. This is one that I particularly like because a lot of them are just really cheap plastic. This one has a pretty durable metal body. And that way, if you need to run it for uh, like 45 minutes, say, 
then you just turn the timer to that and it'll turn off. So it's not like you're going to forget. If you are not going to use this and are going to use a hose, I highly, highly recommend you make use of the alarm clock or timer on your phone. Because if you're anything like me, you will turn a drip irrigation system connected to a hose on and you will wake up the next morning and think, I just watered for the last 18 hours when all I wanted to do was water for half an hour. So my personal policy is if I'm ever connecting anything to a hose to run, especially a drip irrigation system where it's not like a sprinkler system where you'll see it out the back window and you'll see you know, the water spraying through the air. My personal policy is if I'm ever connecting anything to a hose and going to leave it on that's related to drip irrigation or just a hose on a trickle, the timer on my phone get set for the amount of time and started before I turn that hose on. And that's the only way I know that I'll remember to turn it off. Uh, because yeah, those drip irrigation systems, since they go slowly and the soil can suck it in, if you forget it for three days, it'll sometimes just keep running. Okay, from Roberta. Are you concerned about leaving tomato roots in the garden as related to nematodes? Uh, no. So if, if I know I have a nematode problem in a section of the garden, I will potentially leave that section of the garden like fallow, like not grow any of the nematode crops, maybe just grow a cover crop for a season or two if I have other areas where I can grow. Uh, if you do really have a nematode problem and you're going to keep growing, sure, you, you can dig the roots out, but realistically, that's probably not going to control the nematodes. Uh, it's kind of tough. I do have one raised bed. It's another example of why raised beds are not always the best to import soil. Uh, never had nematode problems in the ground in my uh, veggie garden at my place, but one of our raised beds does have nematodes. Now, we don't know if it came on the soil from the soil yard or not, but it's a little suspicious. It's a good soil yard and you know there's only so much quality control they can do with all the soils that they're bringing in but it's just another thing to kind of think about uh don't regret putting in the raised beds but we're just like not growing uh carrots in that bed for a few years because uh the roots have been kind of funky uh vivian can lettuce be grown over summer if kind what kind or is lettuce only a cool weather crop good question if you are in a hot area Lettuce is primarily a cool weather crop. So planted in the fall, October, November, uh, grown through like now. Our lettuce in our beds now is starting to get to where once it starts getting hotter, what happens with lettuce is there's like a lot of milky sap when you harvest it and that's very bitter. Couple of tricks. The first biggest one that you wanna know, so even this is still like the tail end of our winter crop. When you harvest that, once it has that kind of uh, milky sap that's bitter, harvest it put your harvest into a big bowl of cold water for at least a half an hour, maybe change the water one extra time as well. That will kind of suck that sap out and it will make the crop taste way better once it gets into that warm season where you're starting to develop that. Other than that, if you go to some of the specialty uh, seed growers, like especially uh, like Johnny's selected uh, Johnny's seeds, they do a lot of development for these organic farms that have specific needs. And so you can literally go on there and tell, tell it you wanna see the varieties of heat resistant lettuce it has and get some. Now there's only so much heat resistant. So if you wanna to try to do those in the spring, I also recommend putting them in areas where they're gonna get some afternoon shade or even growing it under like some 50% shade cloth. Sometimes what we will do is we will grow down the middle of the row up a trellis, we'll be growing our tomatoes or our cucumbers, which are gonna take over most of that bed. And then on the north side of it, where it'll get a little bit shade and shelter from that trellis, we'll grow just like one little row of lettuce. So it stays actually in part shade over the summer and it's not gonna be as good or grow as long into the season as uh, like our fall cool season let lettuce crops, but it's a way to kind of extend it. Uh, So from Dr. Igor, so it's, sorry if I missed it, how would you provide drainage for the beds you have constructed? How about that in the case of one foot high and two foot high beds? If your beds are one foot high and on normal soil, even if it doesn't drain great, 
I normally don't worry about drainage uh, because you're going to have that good one foot of soil where most of the roots are going to be. And then even if after a foot, it drains a little slower, water can generally drain out kind of like the sides if it's excessive, uh, like at the ed edges of the raised bed, especially even if it's uh, like a clay or soil, you can use a shovel or use a pick or a mattock to just kind of break up the soil underneath where the raised bed is going to be. Uh, and that'll provide some extra drainage down into the native soil. If you have gravelly or sandy soil or just any kind of mix, uh, normally you're just fine because that raised bed is going to give you that extra drainage. On a two foot high raised bed, I really don't worry about it. Uh, when I grow, like when I had those raised beds that I had uh, over concrete, it's just soil all the way down. I didn't bother with an extra drainage layer underneath. And when I would dig in, because this is the first time I did that when I had that example, uh, I would dig down every once in a while to test, you know, kind of see how things are. And sometimes after irrigation, you know, it takes a while for it to drain out just from the kind of little like minuscule gap in between the concrete. So literally no drainage through there and the edge of uh, the concrete and the wood, that gap. So basically if there's extra water, it would slowly drain out. But eventually kind of knowing that I don't need to water so much that it's coming out, I'd use that as an indicator and I'd figure out my timing to where, how long do I water when I water from when the soil is dry and I need to water again, how long do I water until I rehydrate the soil as much as I need to but there's not a lot of water that needs to drain out. I can kind of use that as a visual cue to figure out how long I do need to water. And then even then, sometimes the water at the very base right on top of the, the soil, at the very base right on top of the concrete would be a, a, a little bit wet and mucky, but because it's like over a foot and a half down of good soil till it gets to that, I didn't really see issues from that. If you wanted to, you can put in like some gravel, which would maybe speed the water from when it gets to the bottom down out through the edges. But I try to always keep things as simple as possible and only make it more complicated or put more materials into it if I identify a problem. And with that two foot height, I just have not had drainage problems even on top of like concrete. Uh, okay, so I think that's the last question that I have. Oh, last question is Allison still here. So last question from Allison about the compost that's given away at the Waterwise Community Center. So I took a class several years ago where we were told that compost contains some composted uh, human waste. Is it safe for vegetable gardens? Good question. Yeah, so the compost that is given away at the Waterwise Community Center does contain what are called biosolids. Basically that is sterilized and pre-composted and then recomposted uh, sewage sludge to just put it openly and honestly. Uh, and basically what happens is the regional plants that create recycled water, after that's done, there's the solids that are left and it's gone through a multiple processes that are natural biological, basically to render it inert. And then it goes to the large composting facility where under very controlled indoor conditions with temperature sensors and humidity sensors, uh, they basically make sure it's both sterilized and composted. I've gone on that tour. seems like they do a really good job. I personally originally only used that compost on my fruit trees and didn't use it on my vegetable beds because I was a little uh, skeptical. But after years of talking to people who have used it on their vegetable beds, hearing how well it does for everybody, I started using it on my vegetable beds. It is approved for agriculture. Uh, the main kind of market for it goes out to farms and I have become comfortable with it. Uh, I kind of figure, I know what it is. I know the process that has gone through. And honestly, at the end of the day, it's stuff that's produced in our community. And so this is about the most ecological way that I could think of for it to be recycled. But I do want to be open with everybody if you are using it. Uh, and it's up to you if you want to use it on your vegetable crops or not. Currently, I do choose to make that choice of doing that. Uh, so how do I get gray water to raised beds? Good question. I honestly, so flip side of that, I honestly don't like to use gray water on my raised beds. 
I will use them with fruit trees. I will use them to use gray water to water, especially like native riparian plants. Uh, but I'm not comfortable using gray water with vegetables because of what's being washed and not processed or composted uh, down drain sometimes that can have bacteria uh, that I wouldn't want going like directly onto my vegetable greens in that unprocessed form. Whereas at the base of fruit trees, there is no way for that, if there even are pathogens in it, those human pathogens can't get all the way through fruit trees as the fruit tree takes up water and into like the fruit of the fruit tree. Uh, so the proper way to deal with gray water really is to have it go into what's called a mulched basin, sometimes a little plastic like valve box from the irrigation supply store or the hardware store would be used to where it goes into a little area that has wood chip mulch around it and it's not really seeing the light of day and the biological activity in that wood chip mulch that it's going into uh, starts to neutralize anything that might be going on there and then it's watering things that are not like directly going onto our vegetables. Other than that, uh, if you were really motivated to, because gray water tends to have like particulate matter into it, it becomes very complicated and in most cases not economically viable to filter gray water to the point where you want to put it through a drip irrigation system. So normally it's kind of like at just the end of an open pipe. Uh, so really the only way, like if it's gray water from like a sink, it's just like very clean kind of hand washing water, you just have it go into a bucket and bring it over to wherever in your garden you want it to go and pour it out. But again, I, I would not particularly recommend it for vegetable gardens because you don't always know what's in that gray water. Uh, so from Vivian, how does tomato trellis using string work? Tomatoes, when they have fruit on them, can get very heavy. And so normally what I like to do is have a more solid frame uh, like one of those wire products, if you need it to be rolled up, like deer fencing can work. And then I just use twine to tie the tomatoes up onto those. Uh, if you have like a very, very sturdy, like rebar or pipe or wood frame, then you could kind of just tie at the top and pull down uh, twine and then kind of loop and tie your tomatoes into that. Some kind of like real production, agricultural greenhouses uh, do that with their tomatoes and then they throw out all of that stuff at the end of the season. But for most of us, that's gonna be a, a lot more work and kind of a lot trickier once the tomatoes really start getting heavy. So generally I recommend kind of a more solid framework and then just using twine as needed to kind of tie the tomato vines or branches into that framework. Okay, thank you very much for all your questions and all the feedback, everybody. Uh, I hope that you learned a lot today. I was very happy to share kind of some of the top things I've learned over the years with you. And please uh, sign up for our newsletter, check out our upcoming classes and our other programs. As people log out, I will just put up the links for that at the very end. And then, yeah, I will do my best to get that little irrigation supplemental recording up uh, by like the end of the day next Saturday. And so look for that coming up as well. And whenever that is ready, I will put the link to that directly into the description where we are going to have the recording of this workshop on our YouTube channel. And that supplement will also be on our YouTube channel as well. So have a good rest of the uh, weekend, everybody. Oh, and Barbara sneaking one last question in before the end. How deep does the T-bar need to be to be used for the trellis? Uh, good question. I tried to get my T-posts in two feet deep to have it really, really steady, depending on your soil, depending on how rocky your soil is, that may or may not be uh, feasible but really two feet is what I aim for. Uh, sometimes you can't get it in quite as much, a minimum a foot, even in pretty tight soil, but basically enough to where it can really kind of support some good weight. If you can't get them in as far, you can all often, you can put them in like a little bit more often as well. So I'll, I will do T bars every, or T posts every eight feet, try to get them two feet into the ground. 
But if you can't get them in as much, maybe you do them every you know, four feet, uh, just as long as it, it feels like it's going to be uh, stable for you. Okay, have a good rest of your weekend, everybody. Happy gardening and have a good spring gardening season. Bye.